Welcome to Silicon Valley Health Institute. My name is Susan Downs and my co-host here is Steve Fox, who's a genius. Oh, you'd love this guy. But anyway, today we have Anthony Haynes. Now, Anthony is my favorite healer. I've got access to all the functional medicine folks and I choose Anthony. And he will be glad to see you all by Skype as long as at one point you go visit him. But you can come stay in my flat and then walk to his office to uh, do that. So he'd be glad to help any of you. He's a best healer, I think, in the whole world. Klinghart might be good too, but uh, those are my opinions. Anyway, a little bit on Anthony. He's been in private practice for over 25 years as one of the most experienced registered nutritional therapists in the UK. He's one of the first practitioners to implement the principles of functional medicine in the UK since 1994. That's a lot way before we heard of it. He's been teaching for 25 years at a variety of nutritional colleges, IOM, CNELM, BCNH, and CNM, and uh, I often see him at the IFM meetings in the U.S. He also uh, co-founded Nutrilink, a company with Michael Ash, another great person, in 1998. He's presented lectures, seminars, and courses on a variety of subjects throughout those years. In particular, in the past, he was studying connections between bacteria and vi viruses and their roles in the pathogenesis of autoimmune conditions. I had all sorts of things going wrong with me, and Anthony was able to tell that the EBV virus was actually creating a lot of havoc in my body. Anybody can do the titers, but he determined that they were really going amok, and it was very helpful. He is known as the practitioner's practitioner. He employs his clinical experience in managing the nutritional needs of his patients, which are over 15,000 at his clinic, the Nutrition Clinic Limited in Harley Street, London. He's also a successful award-winning author of two books on nutrition, The Insulin Factor, published in 2004, and The Food Intolerance Bible, published in 2005. He's appeared on a TV and radio show. In two, March 2011, he was awarded the prestigious CAM, that's Complementary Alternative Medicine, Magazine Award for Outstanding Practice for his many years of educating, inspiring, motivating, and helping practitioners and patients. He is a gem. So welcome, Anthony. Unmute. Unmute. There we go. That's an, that's a pleasure to be with you all. It's a shame that I haven't met, met you personally. So the insulin factor, uh, 2004. And then the Food Intolerance Bible, 2005. I shouldn't have called it that. Somebody else called that. And then, and then what was actually, I got, I'm dying to show you guys. I don't know you at all. And this might be the, the inappropriate, but check that out. Oh. I know. I, I couldn't understand a word of the book, what I wrote. It's, um, you know, just that, that, that was published in Taiwan. Um, and I just thought I'd just show you that because it's so much fun. I mean, just look at that. Which is <laughs> to have a book published in a language you can't even recognize a single word. So um, I'm trying to think of the Western recipe ideas I gave for a Taiwanese diet. It's just, it's just crazy. Why they why they do that? Anyway, listen, Susan it's, it's a, and Stephen, it's a pleasure. It really is a pleasure. Sincere pleasure. It, it, it's such a delight. And with Zoom, um, you know, I, I've been able to. You know, I've been using Zoom now for a month for, for a long time, but now it's solely Zoom. My life is solely Zoom and no face to faces, et cetera, et cetera, in this crazy time. So I'd, I'd love to, um, and hopefully I can share things with you. And unfortunately, I can't learn from you in this. It's more of a one way process. Hopefully, not quite a monologue, but it'll be, it'll be me presenting information, answering, answering questions. That'd it be great. can be two ways. We've can got a lot ways. of yes, yes, top notch people here. Fantastic. So love to be able to, if you've got sort of burning questions, I'd love to be able to answer them because, or we can find out that I can't answer it. Maybe we, we've got a form or something where I can find out an answer at least to, to give you the, uh, I'm also, as Susan's intimated, I, I found that um, basic, basically after about eight years of practice and, and discovering that, that what I recommended to some people did work and what I recommended to someone else that was almost very similar didn't work, you suddenly get to discover that there really is this thing called biochemical individuality that we really are all different and that, that actually just because one person's got this symptom doesn't mean to say they're going to respond to the same approach nutritionally and so i then discovered well how am i going to find out the answer how do i know when when the client or the patient has left the room that, that i recommended the right thing i mean how do we know it's one of those to me it's that question and and, and maybe it's because I've, I've been a sports background and very competitive not not competitive in a way that i would want to do anybody in but i just want to, to get the best result so i go oh 
what do I do? So I, I bought a, a QXCI quantum zero space age NASA machine to do some testing. I did lots of blood tests, lots of functional tests. I, I studied iridology and I taught iridology. Fascinating, the insights of the eyes and how they reflect what goes on inside the body. And it's amazing what you can tell from that, but still it wasn't accurate enough or helpful enough for me to identify how do I know? And so then I discovered this thing called kinesiology muscle testing. And whilst I'm not a formal uh, formally qualified kinesiologist, and maybe some of you are, in which case you'll know completely what I'm talking about, but I found a, a way to determine your individual needs. And, and then at that moment, literally at that moment, I discovered as many others may have done as well, that when you have that kind of process going on, rather than relying on some external factor or external machinery, that you actually get to access an inner knowing, um, and I guess you call it intuition. And there are various different ways of describing intuition, but there's a sort of sort of non-verb, non-linguistic knowing. Um, and then I find that with the muscle testing, I found that I got to know the answer before I got the test result. And so, and then that happened time again, again, and then it happens thousands of times. You start thinking, well, I knew that. And you think, well, is it because I thought it, that I created it, that I'm actually influencing the testing? And so part of the process was to make sure I distanced myself from so take the ego out of it and really be in a meditative state. So the ability to shift uh, brainwave activity just like that instantly because of repetition, having done it. And I reckon I've done about 4 million tests now. And so there's a, there's an ability to flip from the conscious mind where, where we have this library of information to stop thinking, to be in a mindless state that Eckhart Tolle refers to as mindlessness as opposed to mindfulness. And then, and then, and then you're able to access. But as soon as you engage in an inner, inner narrative, it completely nullifies the access to intuition in my experience. And maybe you've experienced the same thing too. Is that as soon as we start thinking, literally, uh, you, you stop gaining access to the, the bountiful energy knowledge that, that's available for us. And actually then I discovered, I didn't just have to be in the same room as somebody, I could actually do the testing remotely. So a client goes to Australia and I, and I can test them from there, wow. Uh, and it first panned out that I had a family whose mother did muscle testing and I was able to give the information to the mother what to test the daughter with. And then I discovered that, um, that, that effectively it could work long distance effectively. And then I gained confidence. And so I've been doing remote testing effectively for people using um, simple O-ring testing. But most of the time when I'm doing the O-ring testing, it's actually a means of me uh, to verify that the, that the activity in my mind and the brain has gone from my frontal cortex to somewhere else um where the, the it's an out sort of i guess it's an alpha wave activity where it's more of a meditative state in that meditative state there's a big connection with the gut so the enteric nerves the gut brain axis the gut brain connection um and then the, I, I don't get language downloads some people might have language i just i can i can feel whether something's right or not and it's very difficult to put into language because i don't get communicated with or i can't communicate with that aspect in words um, and I still consider myself a novice and still learning, but I've practiced this for 20 years. And part of the, the objective assessment as to whether this is actually effective or true is I've had, uh, I, I've done, a, I've done a numbers of lab tests and, and I've had 35 different lab tests conducted in 611 tests. So 611 tests, including 35 different tests. So parasite testing, metal testing, homocysteine testing, nutrient testing, toxin testing, etc. 35 different tests and 611 uh, different people doing one test. And 600, 603, 603 of the 611 tests were the same as the muscle test. So it was just, it was just a useful means of objective testing saying that the muscle testing saying you've got this, and then it came back correct 603 times out of 611. So it was, just, it was just a useful, it was just a way of having some objective marker. And of course the muscle test is based on uh, on my appraisal of the case history information where I might indeed have had 500 pieces of data about the client. So it's, it's not all just the muscle testing. It's actually completing the, the whole case history and being able to appraise that. And so with that, I then decided to discover the truth about the, um, the chronic hidden infections in people, which I think any, anyone doing muscle testing or anybody seeing cases of, of chronic ill health will begin to discover that it's, there are toxins and, and viruses and maybe toxins lay, lay the path for, chronic infections too. So I began to discover, and I had the great pleasure of meeting Yehuda Schoenfeld, who you may know, and Tom O'Brien's a good friend of mine, and, and the whole IFM crowd um, you may be familiar with. But I find that the chronic hidden infections seem to open a doorway to autoimmunity in particular. So with, um, with, with effectively with Hashimoto's, with um, 
uh, parietal cell antibodies, so that's the, the, the um, pernicious anemia. Um, then you've got rheumatoid arthritis, MS, sarcoidosis, sclerodoma, uh, psoriasis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I found a time and time again, there were hidden infections um, in those individuals that seemed to be drivers for the condition. And I had the great fortune of, again, it's sort of like, is it chance favors the, no, what is it there? Chance favors the open mind though. No, there's a great expression, which maybe chance favors the prepared mind. And so maybe other people in the audience didn't quite get what this brilliant lecture. So Alan Ebringer, he was an English, uh, I think he's an Australian um, English professor um, at King's College. He spent 35 years looking at uh, the biomolecular um, aspect of certain chronic autoimmune conditions. So he's the chap who discovered that uh, Klebsiella pneumonia was linked with ankylosing spondylitis. You're familiar with that, right? Maybe a thumbs up, you can show me that. You're familiar with that. I can see some of you, yes. So he was the guy who put that on the map. And so he's the guy who said, we'll have a low carbohydrate diet for ankylosing spondylitis because you won't feed the Klebsiella and then you won't have the symptoms. And we know this is true. And he's the guy who identified that Proteus mirabilis and perhaps other bugs too were associated with rheumatoid arthritis, which you may have heard too, right? Proteus mirabilis. Well, uh, I had the pleasure of learning from him. And my very first client back in England was, was actually, as it happens, a man, not a woman, with RA, with rheumatoid arthritis. I showed him, I had the papers right there. I photocopied the papers and I said, look, it's either, and he said, I don't want to take methotrexate. I don't want that. It's because the side effects are not great. And I don't want to take other immune suppressants. So let me do what you do. At least I'll give it a go. Because my doctor, my rheumatologist doctor, who's got 40 years experience, he's a professor, he says, I'll never, I'll never be free of this and I need these, these immune suppressants. So he followed the protocol and I used a special um, oregano extract. You may be familiar with the company Biotics Research in Houston. They make this emulsified oregano extract, ADP oregano. Um, and he took that for a six week period of time alongside another antimicrobial to inhibit the proteus, which muscle testing indicated that he had. And um, he said, and he was an engineer. So fortunately I had an engineering male brain um, as, as my, my first, so yep, he's got Proteus. So we did, so I showed him the papers. He, he believed it, he understood the systems, he understood the energetic pathways for muscle testing, even though we'd never seen muscle testing before. But his niece had gotten so much better from her chronic condition that he was ready to believe what I was gonna say anyway. So it was a fortunate situation. Six months later, no RA whatsoever. So pain reduction still had slightly gnarled, gnarled knuckles. He went to see his professor and the professor said, um, no, you haven't got RA. And so my client said, I was told when I was diagnosed that I was going to have an RA forever. And so the professor said, well, the, 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 the numbskull who recommended that didn't know what he's talking about. And my client said, well, professor, it was you. And the professor goes, and literally ushers my client, who's been a, he's been a mid-sized company director. He's an engineer, so he's got a good degree. He's been, he's been managing a company of, of, of uh, about 500 staff. So he's a, he's a well-to-do individual, very bright and very capable. He was physically ushered out of the room by the professor who wouldn't hear of it. You could possibly be free of RA. Um, and he's, he's no doubt a brilliant um, diagnostician, this professor, I mean, hands-on, skills, fantastic, but he could never believe that someone had resolved the condition um, by any means whatsoever. So it's just, it just a great story. So it's the, the hidden microbes. And from that moment, from that, from that first, that lecture for Alan, Alan Ebringer, Professor Alan Ebringer, now retired, Professor Emeritus, uh, I then explored other underlying causes, and I had the pleasure of knowing Alex Vasquez, who you may know of, who's a, who's a genius, and uh, I've seen a little bit of work of Datis Karajian as well, but uh, and, um, certainly uh, Professor Jude Schoenfeld. And when I've heard Dr. Schoenfeld just declare that autoimmunity is fundamentally linked to toxins and bugs, uh, quote unquote. And so it's. Can we, can we back off a second and, and start with a more basic uh, approach to for people who aren't. Uh, familiar with the concept of uh, functional medicine and how would you go about explaining that basic difference to people mm. who've never heard the message before? Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. A great question. Um, you know your audience and forgive me if I don't in that sense. The, um, so uh, medicine, as I talk about this quite often, medicine is, uh, is it provides a model of understanding and they're, they're basically it's, it's pathology, the, the quickest route to pathology is what's, what's it. So I want a diagnosis, diagnostic code, and then I want the drug protocol. And the drug protocol is looking to suppress the symptoms of the pathology. 
So medicine is designed for that. And so to be a general practitioner or GP in the UK, um, basically they spot the red flags and they refer to a specialist to get the diagnosis, to get on board the drug therapy ASAP. A functional medicine practitioner has a, has a naturopathic holistic um, understanding. The model is very different. And we're looking at the, at the underlying causes, the antecedents and predecessors and underlying causes of someone's condition, identifying what they may be, and then looking to change those underlying conditions in order to have a positive outcome in the condition. So, and, and then with that, you're not using medications, you're using natural remedies to achieve that with, so manipulating food, lifestyle, and using concentrates in the form of supplements, which achieve something that diet never can. Um, and, I, and that's what I've witnessed. And I did have the belief, uh, Stephen and, and Susan, that, that I thought supplements were not necessary, you can do everything with diet. And I believe that in 1990, 1991, just really stalwart and I became a little bit pig-headed and realized that it was just I was holding on to a belief that food does everything food can do everything and I discovered that it frankly doesn't and then I witnessed 17,000 different changes mostly with nutritional supplements but of course you can have someone avoid gluten and they can have amazing changes but I found that I found that the people that tend to seek me out tend to have chronic conditions which need therapeutic intervention with nutritional supplements uh, and I guess with 28 years of practice and experience and, and many thousands of hours of study, uh, it, it, it's something that, I, that I'm familiar with using. But again, I wonder how any nutritional therapist or any naturopath ever chooses a specific supplement if they don't have some form, really, of, of energetic form of testing. Because you can have different companies make vitamin Cs, different companies make different mm -hmm. oreganos or oreganos. Um, and it's, it's, I find it so that 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 also was part of the process before I discovered this muscle testing process to, to make it as individual as possible. So functional medicine engages the patient as a partner in the process of addressing the underlying causes and addressing those in order to achieve the outcome in the swiftest, safest manner. So I hope that that sets the scene on that. And so and I think functional medicine in, in one survey was the was the fastest growing uh, non-conventional medical group in the world and the Institute of Functional Medicine and stalwart uh, trainings. In fact, Neutralink, the company I co-founded, but mainly with Michael Ash, um, how, uh, we, host, we host their teachings um, in the UK, but of course now things are online, and, but we're still facilitating and hosting their, their trainings. And now I think they're doing training in China um, and they're looking elsewhere as well. But so the Institute of Functional Medicine are pioneering this sort of, um, it's really, it's really from, from pathology medicine to addressing underlying biochemistry. And so you have to learn a lot of nutritional biochemistry in order to be able to know what to, to do as opposed to there's a symptom, let's use that drug. So suppressing. So of course every drug by definition has a side effect. And we're looking to address the underlying causes. And the vast majority of people that, that we know and come to see see us um, want to address something without a medication. So what's very interesting is when we looked at when surveys have been conducted looking at what pe who patients have seen, they get the diagnosis from the doctor using medical technology. And then they go and seek help from a functional medicine practitioner to resolve it. And so they found that uh, when they, they tracked the insurance, they said, well, actually, they had one appointment with the doctors or two to get the diagnosis. But then they had three, four or five or six with a functional medicine practitioner because that they, most people uh, in the survey at any rate wanted to address things uh, with the underlying cause. And so and that's the arena in which I've been training. And that's the only arena I have. So I have. I have never been trained as a medical doctor. I'm involved in teaching GPs in the, in the UK. I've been involved in teaching that. And I do understand that there's very, very little nutritional biochemistry teaching in, in a medical degree. And so it's just literally, it's just, it's just chalk and cheese. There's just very little training in that. And so there's no criticism. It's simply saying, well, that's what they do. And that's what we do. Um, so, you know, and um, would that I've done medical training as well. I know that uh, a few of my colleagues are medical doctors and nutritionists as well. And they practice functional medicine. But I, I'll tell you this, if I may, is I've never met a single doctor who, on engaging in a functional medicine approach, has ever reverted and gone back, which I think is interesting in itself. Uh, you know, once you're there, once once you're, if dare I say it, once your eyes have been opened, they don't they don't they don't close. I've seen the same thing with uh, physicians who have integrated vitamin C therapy into their practices. Yeah, and that's one example, of course, hot topic. Um, the information from the Chinese um, hospitals looking at um, using, using it in this current situation, finding that they, that they actually saved at least 33% of lives with actually more end stage patients, not just people who just come in. Um, so it's 33 to 50% of lives saved. Uh, that information has been suppressed and censored in this country, so it doesn't get out, but they're certainly not using it in the UK.
Anyway, I, um, so now I'm, I'm very happy to be directed by Susan or yourself, Stephen. To, uh, to... We, want, we want you to go into the issue with uh, allopathic approaches to thyroid hormone and then branch off into yeah. a functional medicine. Um, yeah. Persistent. Well, what, what I would like is whatever guidance you get will be interesting to the audience to do that. And the audience can chip in. I have a feeling you can kind of you know, resonate with the audience to see what might be most useful. So I want to give the floor to you in any way you want to use it. And we welcome uh, input, questions, et cetera, from the audience. That's yeah, now if, you, if you're in the audience and you want to ask a question of Anthony personally, uh, raise your hand. And if you've never seen the raise hand button, um, it, if you click on the participants um, symbol at the bottom of the center of your screen, it'll pop up and there'll be a little hand sitting there and you click on it and I will see your hand raise on my screen. Okay, and I'm glad this is being recorded, Stephen. Now, the thing with Anthony Haynes is that, um, I don't know, was it the car accident where I nearly died when I, at 21, when I got a bash on the head? And since then, I just haven't gone slow. It's like, um, and I'm serious, I've actually gone faster. I speak faster, I do, you know, I speak faster and I, it's almost like too much information. But since about the age of 21, when I had that near death car experience, I have gone a bit faster. So I do apologize that it's challenging for me when I get excited and passionate about something to go a little bit slower. Um, so I'm very glad it's been recorded and, and thanks for that for Stephen's technological help. But it could be possible then you could re-listen to it again. And so it's gonna be dense data here because because uh, I'm gonna download some information. So. Thyroid testing and thyroid, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating subject. It really is. And the more I dig into it, the more interested I become, not the less interested. And sometimes I come across subjects where I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like, yeah, well, it, it doesn't really interest me. But the more pages I turn, uh, the more gripping it gets. It is absolutely fascinating. What I wasn't taught and what hasn't been taught and certainly hasn't been taught in, in medical degrees, as far as I know, uh, not having done one myself. I have a sports science degree background and three years of nutritional study. And then I've been teaching and learning um, ever since. Um, and so uh, thyroid hormone function, there's uh, basically medical doctors are looking for thyroid stimulating hormone produced by the anterior pituitary, which is a message to the thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. The thyroid gland produces 80% T4, 20% T3. T3 is the active thyroid hormone, but it needs to be in its free form, free and active form, not its bound form, in order to have the effect of gene expression on the cell. And the T3 is what matters most of all. The blood test looks for TSH, T4 and T3. And really we need to look at free T4 and free T3 to get an idea of what the levels are circulating in your arm when you have the blood test. And presumably that blood will be circulating around your body. But what the test doesn't show you, it doesn't show you how it's working inside your cell. So what's in your bloodstream may not be actually what's going on in your cell level. And so in one small study, it's interesting to note that seven out of eight of the individuals on thyroxine were fared better when they took a higher dose than that which their blood test indicated. So now in England, typically the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary to thyroid is the only marker that's tested because it's cheap. It's an easy, cheap test to do and to say, well, that's your thyroid marker. Now, there are many things that influence TSH, not just the level of T3. And so it's a wholly inaccurate and inappropriate marker on which to base medical therapy. And that's a fact. You, can't, you, you have no idea what the T3 is unless you measure it. You could have high or low TSH. Uh, now, normally with high T3, the TSH should be low. It's true. But it's an, it's an imperfect negative feedback loop with TSH and a T3 circulating. So... Uh, researchers in 2017 in one paper, and I've been aware of this since I was taught in 1997 by a very wise man who's now since passed away. He, he taught me, he said, go with signs and symptoms, Anthony. He said, go with signs and symptoms. Blood tests are a useful guide for antibodies to see what's going on with the antibody TSA with Hashimoto's, uh, but and they could be a useful guide to monitor your treatment, but they're not a really good indication to determine whether you can diagnose someone with a thyroid condition because subclinical hypothyroidism is affecting millions of individuals. In, in some studies, it shows it's a, it's a low percentage, but you go to 45 to 64 year old women and the, the figures go up to 17 to 19% on medical assessment based on blood tests. What about the grayscale that aren't picked up by the blood tests, but outside the reference range, and you get up to possibly 40% of 40 year olds, 50% of 50 year olds, 60% of 60 year olds. It's a huge, huge issue. And the reason I've chosen this 
for my uh, I've got my website up now and I haven't had the need before because I've had the blessing of having a um, of having had a few articles in national papers and then I've had literally hundreds and hundreds of clients from that so I actually haven't had the need for a website but now I've got haineshealthmanuals.com and that's my website haineshealthmanuals.com and the first subject is subclinical hypothyroidism now I've got some, I've got three free videos on there and I've got access to, to others and I'll be putting more information up there and then the, the, the subclinical hypothyroidism again it's like it's not quite a Pandora's box but it's it's a it's like a mini encyclopedia of oh wow did you know the thyroid was involved in this did you know the thyroid was involved in that did you know um, and what I've done is I've actually identified the exact mechanism of all the thyroid symptoms um, as to why they happen. And I explained that in one of my, in one of my, in my short course, which is a six module video course. But I, I actually, I did have to search through the papers and have to find out. But do you know why you have hair loss with low thyroid? Do you know why? Well, I'll tell you why. You need T3 to basically get to the, the hair bulb and in something called a niche. So it's a niche or niche. Right, the T3 has to latch on to the niche and it releases stem cells from the niche. Then, then the stem cells can travel the very short distance to the hair bulb and help stimulate the hair follicle growth. So T3 is required for that. If you don't have adequate T3, that doesn't happen. And so as a consequence, you get less than ideal hair growth. And so that's just one mechanism. And many mechanisms are associated with, with, with dry skin, constipation, high cholesterol, um, excess hair in the wrong place, uh, dry eyes, um, 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 water retention in the eyes, water retention in your ankles, and you also you've got non-pitting edema or pitting edema um, in, in that as well. So there's a mechanism for each and every single sign and symptom. So I think Stephen Langer wrote a book on it, and I was taught by this very wise man in 97, signs and symptoms, Anthony, signs and symptoms. And so what the medical world is looking for, they're looking for a, a reference range. Are you in the reference range? Now you can be in the reference range, and this is the point. You can be in the reference range and guess what? You can have a subclinical condition which is affecting the quality of your life and does so for years. And it's particularly relevant in women. Yet again, women are suffering just as they do with autoimmunity. The vast majority of conditions on planet Earth affect women more. It's so unfair. You deserve a medal. And, and men in the audience, we need to raise our hand um, to, to the women in our lives and around us. Um, it is, and especially after giving birth to babies, you're more likely to have a thyroid issue too. So it's more women get affected. Um, and, and there may be very good reasons for that, but it's unfortunate and it's true. So remember that women, um, so women are more likely to have autoimmune conditions and the most common autoimmune condition on the planet is Hashimoto's. And that's separate and it can interfere with uh, thyroid hormone function. But I'm talking about subclinical hypothyroidism in this instance without the autoimmune state. We haven't got um, TPO or thyroglobulin antibodies. So signs and symptoms, so hair loss, weight gain that's difficult to lose in fact i can just look at food anthony and i gain weight that kind of that kind of thing and i'm and, and, and i've got weight piling on but i'm not eating too much food the doctor says that i was a liar i can't possibly gain the weight but I, but actually not, and i deny now i've got low self-esteem now i'm wondering whether i actually am overeating in my sleep because i'm gaining weight that fast i've got constipation i've got dry skin i've got cracked heels my eyebrow on the outer side that's the hair tog sign i'm losing that i'm losing hair on there and i'm getting hair in the wrong place i'm getting more hair on my arms more hair on my face um what the heck's going on it's part of aging i'm told apparently i'm i'm, I'm a woman of a certain age and now i might need some medicalization for my natural menopause state and i might need to take some some hrt which might ameliorate those symptoms ah oh, and all these and then i've got aches and pains so that's a list of subclinical hypothyroid symptoms. I mean, how many people do we meet with that? And it's the collection of them together. Um, I know Dr. David Brownstein personally, he works in Chicago in the Goethe Belt, and he does a palpation himself, actually hands on the thyroid, and he can feel whether it's slightly enlarged. And the, the thyroid will become enlarged if there's not enough iodine around. Now, our iodine is essential. It's also potentially an issue with autoimmunity. Uh, in terms of Hashimoto's, so I, we need to be careful with iodine. We can't simply go and take iodine because for some folk, the iodine can actually promote the Hashimoto's uh, condition itself. So one does need to take great care with iodine, but one does need enough. And typically, the further away you are from a coastline, because iodine is found in the sea, uh, the less likely you are to have adequate iodine. And there are poems in Swiss, dare I say it, French or German, um, about the Swiss mountains, about the, the, the mountain folk with thick necks. And so I've looked up in the history, the history of iodine um, the sorry, history of, of, of low thyroid is that there are stories and poems of, of mountain men and mountain women with large throats because of course they've been living in the mountains furthest away from the sea furthest away from iodine 
having having goiter effectively a, la a large large thyroid now we can have uh, underactive thyroid hormone without having a ray uh, a, a swollen a swollen thyroid for sure um, and so there are factors that also affect thyroid and thyroid affects so many aspects one of my clients uh, who is looking to have a, a baby and was temporarily infertile age about 34 um, and she was told by her gynecologist that, that her thyroid hormone had nothing to do with fertility. And I thought that was interesting because there's a thyroid hormone receptor on every single cell in your womb, my dear. So next time you see him, maybe you can show him this paper, which there you go. It's a photocopy of the paper. And maybe you can ask the, the endocrinologist who spent, spent seven years trained to be a doctor and then specialty in gynecology for another three or four years. And they're saying that your thyroid hormone has got nothing to do with fertility. Um, so it's, it's interesting how, again, how siloed uh, different aspects can be so i'm being critical of that individual yes i am and i haven't met them but it, it is it's a silly thing to do so we i we, we did a test on the thyroid to show the doctor and to show the lady that she had subclinical at least to heading towards primary hypothyroidism corrected her thyroid hormone levels naturally with natural remedies and lo and behold she conceived and had a healthy baby we can't prove the connection of course but it was just one of the many stories so thyroid hormone affects a whole array of things there are two receptors on the human body that are most plentiful. And, uh, and if I ask you to guess, you might guess that of course it is thyroid hormone and vitamin D is the other. Now when a cell has a receptor uh, for something on it, do you think that uh, that means that that is gonna have a function inside the cell? Yes, it is. So thyroid hormone receptor is the most plentiful along with vitamin D, the VDR, vitamin D receptor there is in the body. So thyroid hormone affects every aspect of health, which is why it can, it can cause those varied signs and symptoms. The first thing I think of when I see someone with high cholesterol is whether they have low thyroid. That's my first question. My mother, aged, she's now 83, um, that when she was 70, high cholesterol, I said, mum, yeah, I think you should ask your doctor if you've got low, you've got low thyroid. The doctor said to my mum, no, 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 that's ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. She, she said, my son is a practitioner in London. And this is a, or Harley Street, which is a famous medical street in London. Um, and he says uh, that I might have a say. She said, OK, let's do the thyroid test based on that. And this is a village in, 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 in Essex, just northeast of London. Um, and so we came back and lo and behold, my mother needed thyroxine. She took thyroxine, which I think can be a very good drug indeed. Uh, if you call it a drug, it's a hormone replacement. Um, and her cholesterol came down, lo and behold. So well, didn't need the expensive statin drug, which also has not been shown to be effective, particularly in postmenopausal women either. And so, so just in that one instance, so again, my, mother's, my mother now believes I'm, I'm, I'm more knowledgeable than perhaps I might be on the basis of that. Um, but it's, uh, it's just interesting. There's so many aspects of health. So thyroid affects lipoprotein lipase enzymes in your liver. Well, thyroid, is, thyroid affects so many different aspects of health. And so there's a multiplicity. So the reason I've chosen this subject in particular to be the first manual, as it were, it's going to be sort of a, a video course, is because it affects so many, so many people and so many things in so many people. It's a multiplicity. Now I can see some lovely ladies' uh, lives. I can see, and I can call out some of your names. I can see some of you literally there live. And, I, and I, otherwise, I've got black screens with your name on. And I understand that because it means you can relax where you're at. But I really appreciate you being there. Um, but I've got men and I've got women. Now, uh, if you're a woman and you're over 40, you've got a chance of having subclinical hypothyroidism. I mean, and, and, and I, I guess you might live on the coast in California as well, potentially. You might live somewhere else, further away from ID. But my curiosity has peaked is that I wonder just how many women are struggling with conditions um, which are associated with subclinical hypothyroidism and they're told or they believe that it's completely normal. It must be an aging phenomenon and learn to live with it. Now, for me, the, the books that come out and say, you know, how to learn to live with MS, learn to live with your RA, learn to live with this, learn to live with this, uh, the books that I would burn. Uh, that, 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 so Fahrenheit 451, written by uh, Ray Bradbury, if you remember that book, where the firemen burn books. It's a bit of a revolutionary book. And of course, I'm reading George Orwell's book again right now, and you know why, 1984. Um, and I didn't know it was supposed to be manual, but it seems to be that way. Um, and uh, so anyway, Fahrenheit 451, um, burning books. How do I get to that? Um, yes, so it's... Um, well, let's, let's, let's take it yeah. from thyroid to its influence on immunity and uh, COVID risk. Yes. So when you've got low thyroid, you've got low energy. So it's a low energy. Now, energy is the universal molecule for all aspects and all systems of health. So one's immune system will be less capable of functioning if you have low energy. A energy is the universal molecule for function. 
and so you you simply won't have enough so low thyroid will have low energy and low energy will be low immunity it is literally a direct line effect also with low thyroid is that then one's one's eating habits and you might be more inclined to eat sugar so what i also found Stephen and Susan, is I found uh, research papers showing that people with subclinical hyperthyroidism are more likely to be addicted to carbohydrates and sugar and or alcohol. And so in those things will also have a, a negative effect is that the immune system has been shown to actually be depleted or lowered for 24 hours after having a, a certain amount of sugar. So sugar depletes the immune system. It's also an anti-nutrient. And if it's an anti-nutrient, then you won't have the vital nutrients of zinc and vitamin C to mount an appropriate antibody response to any virus or, or any bacteria, indeed. So, so low thyroid, low energy. Um, and then, of course, you actually end up with, a, with low energy. You end up with an inability to carry out detoxification processes in the liver as well. The liver is a very energetic organ. You also end up with low ability to digest food because digestion is also a hugely energetic process. It's estimated that 40% of the body's energy should be diverted, needs to be diverted to the digestive function. 40% of the whole daily output is geared towards the gut. And if you've got low energy, that ain't gonna work properly. And if that doesn't work properly, um, guess what? 70% of the whole immune system lines the intestinal lining, the common mucosal immune system. And it's the, the innate immune system which defends us against viruses and bugs. So that will not be ideally nourished as well. So the thyroid will absolutely affect energy, will affect mood, or oh, by the way, depression, Another symptom I haven't quite mentioned, depression and the blues. And we also know the people who are depressed also have a lower immune system. So it's a very good point. because So there's a, there's a swathe of negative impacts that the low thyroid will have on the immune system, for sure. And subclinical hypothyroidism is literally, it's, it's not the elephant in the room, but it, it's certainly a hidden factor which affects a huge number of individuals, particularly women, particularly if you're over 40, and particularly if you've had children too, you're more likely to have a, a thyroid hormone issue. Now, with stress, so with low thyroid, you're also more likely to have a low blood sugar, not a high blood sugar. So it doesn't necessarily automatically increase the likelihood of diabetes, for example, but low blood sugar. And low blood sugar makes you more inclined to eat sugar and carbohydrates. But also with a low blood sugar, the brain nat naturally would stimulate a viral hormone called ACTH from the anterior pituitary to the adrenals to raise cortisol. And when you raise cortisol, you also lower the immune system. It's one of the most powerful immune regulating hormones we have. And so with low thyroid, you can tend to have, at least for a period of time in life, a raised level of cortisol, and cortisol lowers immunity. So we've got a double whammy. We've got lack of energy for the immune system, and then we may have a low blood sugar, and then a raised level of cortisol, which suppresses that um, aspect of our health. So immunity will go down as a result of it. Then, and then, of course, with the habitual habits we have of, of, of overeating carbohydrates or sugar to make ourselves feel better, if you've got subclinical hyperthyroidism, and then they won't be good too. Furthermore, as we discover with comorbidities, Stephen, if you're overweight, you're more likely to have a negative impact um, from any infection um, and you've got other comorbidities. So being overweight and being overweight is a real challenge. Not 100% of women or men who have subclinical hypothyroidism or, or, or hypothyroidism yet to be diagnosed are overweight. It's true. You can be slim and still have a low thyroid. It's definitely true. Um, and then there is this whole population with Hashimoto's, which is the, the next stage, if you will, uh, of autoimmunity. But just because you've got subclinical hypothyroidism does not give you a direct sort of route. The next pit stop is going to be Hashimoto's. That's not the case. So subclinical hypothyroidism. So have you got those symptoms? I hope you're making a note. And what I like to do, Susan, the, the Institute of Functional Medicine has actually produced a questionnaire for that. And I'll, I'll ping that to you later today. And maybe you could ping it to the audience uh, and they can just have a look. And what I've done is I've actually identified a more effective way of scoring it than that which they identified, which is giving you know, one, one, one score, one, one number per symptom. If you score it with three, two, and one for severity, it's actually a much more useful tool for monitoring over time. So you can see a bigger difference. Rather than going from seven to eight over a period of time, you could go from 21 to, to eight or something like that. So if you have a higher scoring questionnaire uh, with greater discernment for severity, so the more severe you score three, the less severe is two, and sometimes you get the symptoms it's one, you get a better discerning for a monitoring tool. So I've got a scoring suggestion to accompany that document, which I will very happily send to you uh, right away, Susan, and you can share that with you. And so that means that you and the audience can actually use that yourselves as a monitoring tool. Now, I'm not, of course, recommending that you do something particular for each one of you is different, but to support your thyroid, but it's, it's, a, it's a means of starting to get, have I, have I got a thyroid problem? Do you think I have? And just as a show of hands, now I can only see about 16 folk on this screen, and I think there are 75 of you listening. Um, 
again, fantastic for me to be here. Wish I could sort of get to know you a bit better, etc. But I wonder, I wonder if we could have a, uh, a show of hands. Thank you, Palmer. Um, nice to see you too. Show of hands. How many do you think? Do you think you might have a thorough problem? You know. So we got. Thank you so much indeed. So we just. Thank you so much, yes. And it may not be that you discovered this thanks to Anthony today. Maybe you knew it already. Maybe the interest of subclinical hypothyroidism as a conversation maybe entice you to, to tune in today to Susan's fantastic program. And it's a pleasure to know Susan and meet Stephen as well. So that's great. Um, we have a couple well. of questions stacked up. Right. Would you like to ask yeah. some questions? Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me, let me Palmer, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away? I'll jump in. It it's such a delight to uh, be here with you. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I think you'll probably get to this naturally, but you mentioned having favorite nutrients to support subclinical hypothyroid. Um, I'm a functional medicine certified health coach. I personally reversed MS, wrote a book about it, not just me, um, which I want to send to you, but I, I really would love to know wow. your favorite nutrients yeah. to tackle this. Um, because I think there is a pandemic yeah, yeah. of women, you know, age I help, 35 to 65 and up, that are oh, struggling. You read my notes, Palm. No, I read your notes. No, we read the notes together. Um, because I held back on using the P word um, because it's lost its meaning. It's like the word stress no longer has meaning because it's just a, it's a sort of cliche. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, health coach is supremely important. How are we going to engage behavioral change in our clients unless we have someone like a health coach to help us? I can know the stuff, but uh, how are we going to get the changes? So the key nutrients, iodine is essential, and we need to make sure we have, we have enough of it. 150 micrograms is the RDA, um, which is a low dose, and I think it's a useful dose to, to bear in mind. Some people might need much higher levels, but we can only absorb a certain amount of iodine at one time. So we need that. And if we take a certain higher level, there could be a potential for triggering Hashimoto's or certainly being involved in that process. So we need to be careful with iodine. And it's difficult to know who might need 12.5 milligrams, so 12,500 versus 150. Um, and we also have the pleasure of knowing Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, who's presented on the subject as well. Um, and, and she does recommend higher doses, but I'm aware that it can trigger that. So iodine is absolutely essential. Tyrosine is the T of T4 and T3. It's a non-essential amino acid derived from phenylalanine, uh, which is the essential amino acid. And tyrosine is generally plentiful in a diet that contains proteins. And so it's unlikely we're going to be short in tyrosine, but sometimes a supplement of tyrosine can be useful for that process, especially if that supplement is taken away from food and not competing with other amino acids. So T and four, four molecules of iodine. And then, we, and then you've got the deiodinase enzyme, which, can, which takes the iodine off T4 and makes it T3. A deiodinase enzyme. The enzymes make sense. It sounds complicated when you first hear it, but actually it's like, oh yeah, that's taking the iodine off. And we've got D1, D2, and D3. So three deiodinase enzymes um, that work. And we, we're, we're concerned with D1 and D2 in particular, and they require selenium. And selenium is required for these deiodinase enzymes that converts T4 to T3. And what's interesting is selenium is often accompanying iodine in nature. And so seafood can contain iodine and selenium. So it's kind of, is that a coincidence? Um, but selenium is also typically lower than ideal in the typical diet because of the processing of food, et cetera. It's just not in the soil anymore. And it's not in the foods that we're choosing to eat in the standard American diet or the standard English diet. And so it's not there. So selenium is vital. That. What's also fascinating about selenium is that it's also been found to lower um, the, the thyroid peroxidase antibodies levels in, in studies. And I found it to be pretty consistently true in, cl in clinical practice too. And um, 200 mcg of selenium can help to lower the antibody count should that be present at the same time. But let's just, let's just talk about underactive thyroid. So selenium is vital. It's also very important as a precursor to a very important antioxidant enzyme protecting your thyroid called glutathione peroxidase. And that, that is dependent on selenium. And so glutathione can protect the thyroid, which is a sentinel gland. Look where it is. Look where the screen is, folks. Why do you think I've got these on? These are blue light blockers. I need a blue light blocking throat thing. I, I want to wear a face. No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't want to wear one of those. I want to have a throat no, I don't. I'm so sorry. I don't want to wear one of those. Um, yes, I am a slave to the state. I'm not going to wear one of those, but I appreciate you have to somewhere. Um, I see people driving their cars on their own with masks on. I have to ask myself, what? Anyway, let's move on to thyroid. Maybe they, they're so subclinically hyperthyroid that they've actually lowered their IQ. And maybe they actually need thyroid help. And maybe that's a call for help that I should be paying attention to. Maybe I should wear a big T-shirt saying, I can help you uh, if you're wearing a face mask in your car. The, um, so we've got iodine and we've got tyro uh, tyrosine and we've got selenium. 
Now, there is one very wise doctor um, whose name actually is a Polish name. I think it's Walecki in Houston. And he identified that rubidium, rubidium, a, a, a sort of ultra trace nutrient, again, selenium is tiny amounts, micrograms, is also vital to transport tyrosine into the thyroid gland. Rubidium. So really interesting. It's very rare. And uh, I'm aware of that through the studies, through, through, through my association with, uh, with using biotics research products. They, they, they have rubidium in a couple of their products, but it is really interesting. Um, so, we, so you might have tyrosine adequacy, but, but and it gets into your thyroid gland um, effectively with the help of rubidium. So they're my favorite nutrients. Protein is vital, um, but also reducing inflammation, Parma. So if you have too much inflammation, you directly stop the conversion of T4 to T3 because that they directly interfere with the production of D1, D2. So D1 inflammation through interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha will reduce um, the deiodinase activity. So you can have all the nutrients available for the thyroid, but you've got too much inflammation. Too much inflammation will directly stop the thyroid hormone conversion. And guess what? If you don't have adequate free T3, who cares about free, free T4? Because the T4 is a pro-hormone. T3 is where it's at. And so, so we need to reduce inflammation. Also, if one is overweight, you've got an increased levels of adipokines, which are fat cytokines effectively um, from the visceral adipose tissue. And that will also interfere with the conversion of T4 to T3. And then we have stress, the oh, stress factor, anxiety. Oh, I'm having anxiety about people wearing masks in their cars. I should let that go. Um, anxiety and stress, cortisol directly impairs the conversion of uh, T4 to T3 by interfering with D1 and D2. What's fascinating with this, let me share this with you, is that it, it decreases the activity of D1, which is systemic in the body. So you get lower level of T3 in the body. So the feedback from T3 to the brain is less when you've got stress. But D2, which is more intracellular and certainly in the brain next to the anterior pituitary and hypothalamus, increases D2. So you get an increased level of, D, of T3 very close to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus goes, oh, I've got enough. I don't need to make so much TSH. So TSH goes down. The body levels go down because the D1 is suppressed by stress. So you've got a double whammy. You end up with low TSH and low T4. But you do a blood test from the doctor. The doctor only measures TSH and thinks, oh, you've got hypothyroidism. You've got hypothyroidism. Oops. They haven't looked at T4 and T3. Well, if they look at T4 and T3, they say, well, your T4 and your T3, they're, they're both low. What's going on? I don't know. We don't know what to do. I, I, we simply don't know what to do. But basically, stress does an amazing thing. It preserves the body for our evolutionary development of survival, essentially, um, for this uncertain future that clearly stress must manifest. And so it's really interesting what happens with the, with the whole process of stress. Stress lowers the body level, the D1, D1 conversion, increases the D2, but that raises T3 in the brain. And then the brain goes, oh, I've got enough T3. I'll lower my TSH. So you end up with a lower TSH and low T4 and low T3. And so the blood test comes back with TSH and let's say the TSH is normal, but it's, it's, it's artificially normal, if you like, because stress has kept it low. And then you think, well, it's not thyroid. There's nothing wrong with me. I must take the antidepressants that are now being recommended. Let's go to Melanie. Yep. Melody. Melody. Can you up. unmute yourself, Melody? Uh, yes, I, I have. All right. Good. Hi, Melody. Hello. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, I, no, I, my question is, um, I came in a little bit late, but um, I, I, I kind of, I, I wrote, um, actually, I didn't really have a question. I was just kind of telling you about my history. I was diagnosed uh, by an endocrinologist with subclinical hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's at the age of 57. Um, she started me on low-dose Synthroid, which I've been on, and I've been on the same dose for eight years now. Um, at the time, I was, had probably 40 pounds over my normal weight. Um, I completely, I, I went on a plant-based diet and uh, with a Synthroid and then totally uh, turned everything around, lost the weight. I still have Amazing. a few symptoms and I'm still looking for lifestyle means to improve those symptoms. So um, coming, listening to, um, I, I'd heard some information about the selenium. Um, the protein thing just, uh, piqued my interest when you said protein. I was like, okay, um, since I've been mostly on vegetable protein, very little animal protein, I'm a little curious to know more about that aspect of it. I mean, I've done a lot to improve my health and turn things around. Um, Good, let's go to Anthony's answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, adequate protein is required for, for all things. Protos is the Greek word for, 
for meaning first, and I would estimate that protein is the first most important nutrient for human beings after we breathed air and drunk water. So protein is hugely important to make all the enzymes and hormones and body tissues you've got. Um, I'm just putting that um, something off the screen, excuse me a second. And thank you for, for joining us, Melody, and so on. So adequate protein is vital. I want to share with you an absolutely key fact about protein, just in case you didn't know it. There are three macronutrients, there's fat, protein, and carbohydrate. The only one that it has a thermogenic effect, i.e. it actually requires calories in order to use it, is protein. In one group, they took healthy individuals, it's true, not individuals with Hashimoto's, um, and they, they had them eat a certain diet that was carbohydrate dominant, and they measured, their, they measured their whole metabolism and how many calories they're burning a day. They took the same group, they washed out for a couple of weeks, they then came back, and they put them on the protein diet, um, and they found they had the same number, they were eating the same number of calories, as they consumed in the previous couple of weeks assessment. And they found that they burned 300 calories more when they had protein at each meal. It was pretty impressive. Now these were healthy folk with healthy metabolisms, but for you, Melody, I would say that having adequate protein, treating it as the first most important thing. I'm not saying have a high protein diet, what is that anyway? But, a, but adequate protein on a regular basis, protein each meal, particularly at breakfast, absolutely vital to support your ability to burn fat effectively, and actually has a thermogenic effect, so it means you're going to be using up calories with that. Always have a minimum, a small to medium portion of carbohydrates to minimize insulin. Insulin is the store fat hormone in your body, or don't burn fat hormone. And insulin is also the most pro-inflammatory hormone we've got. So in order to minimize your, your storage of fat and, and uh, your fat, uh, to access your fat and to, to enable your body to, to basically gain access to fat, the best thing to do is to minimize insulin. So you have a medium to small portion of carbohydrates. And furthermore, I would suggest that at breakfast time, you do not have any carbohydrate. Now, I don't know what you're currently eating to know how different that is to what you're doing, but I would say that uh, no carbohydrate at breakfast, small to medium portion at lunch and dinner to minimize insulin and also to optimize the thermogenic effect, essentially. And I would recommend you do not have a lot of vegetables raw of the goitrogen family. It's really lots and lots of veggies raw. It probably could be a problem. It's something I rarely encounter, to be honest. But if you, I mean, if you're having lots and lots of raw cabbage and, and, and broccoli, who does that? Um, but really, it's once you start cooking them, once they're cooked, they're not really a problem. But I have encountered a few clients who are kind of having, the, they've gone really healthy and gone raw, and they've actually really had a negative impact on their thyroid hormones. So I suggest have cooked vegetables, yes, or par-cooked vegetables at least, um, so you're minimizing the potential goitrogens, which basically stop iodine uptake on the thyroid. Um, adequate protein, no carbohydrate at breakfast, and small to medium at lunch and dinner. There you go about talking to her doctor about adding T3 or time release T3 to yeah, her supplement. Yeah, yeah, you're, yes. And there the may well be a use for L-troxin or the T3. That may well be a useful guide. And then I would certainly suggest that that's monitored unless suddenly you end up with a, with a hypothyroid state, which is potential on T3. But yes, it's sort of thing that I don't get involved because I'm a nutritional therapist and a doctor. I, I myself don't get involved in the prescription aspect of, of things, but certainly I, and I can't alter what clients are doing um, as part of the, uh, the guidelines. You don't alter a prescription, but yeah, it's a very good point. T3 may well be helpful. Let's go to Christine. Can you unmute yourself, Chris? There we go. Hi, a couple quick questions. One is uh, early on in the, in the discussion, you mentioned some muscle testing. Can you say a little more about that? And the second question is, for someone who's subclinical hypothyroid and has tried T3 and got palpitations, yeah. what would you suggest instead? Yeah. Thanks, Christine. And actually, you've then spoken to exactly why I suggest you have it monitored, lest you have too high a level, but precisely because of that. So with muscle testing, kinesiology, it's been around for about 70 years. It's a proven science. Um, and um, David Hawkins, uh, PhD, MD, has written books called Power Versus Force is a, is a nice book on the subject, should you wish to know more. And there are different colleges that do two or three uh, courses in, in applied kinesiology, which is using a different muscle testing, different angles, um, legs, arms, uh, to actually determine uh, functions within the body and to get answers and information from the individual you're testing. So, for example, I could put, uh, if I held my thyroid and was tested about thyroid issue, my muscle might go weak here. You may be very familiar with this. Um, and then if I put iodine and tyrosine or a thyroid supplement on that was useful, it may then strengthen it, suggesting that that helps to counteract that weak circuit. 
that was identified. And there are various different, there's a whole whole wheel of testing that you can engage in. And, and I engage in fairly straightforward, simple muscle testing, but, but my wife's qualified or training as a nutritional, as a kinesiologist, and it's a much wide array of testing. But it's a useful individualized process to assess someone's health status and also whether a particular supplement could be useful. Now, with, certainly with T3, I've encountered this before, T3 can definitely lead to palpitations. And so it's almost like the medical route to help the thyroid out would be to give T3, and it's like it's too linear, uh, because actually you're not, you're not supporting the cortisol or blood sugar or other hour reducing inflammation, just giving T3, and it's too powerful a thrust, if you will, uh, for the thyroid hormone. And in fact, what may be more appropriate is to uh, as address, uh, reduce inflammation, and su support the hypothalamic pituitary access, um, supply it with the key nutrients that allow it to make it. And there are also formulae that, that um, may be called T3 Convert or, or, or there's a formula that biotics make called Metastim that helps the conversion of T4 to T3 in a more natural process. And I've never met anybody have palpitations when they're taking Metastim to support T4 to T3, and yet it's helped everyone improve their T3 levels. And so there's sort of, again, hormones, very powerful signaling agents. And I'm very wary of, of hormones in general because they have such a powerful effect. So I would say the conversion for you, Christine, thank you for your question. Convert, finding a metastim from biotics is one I know it's in America. Uh, it's a practitioner company, um, but there are other, other formulae. But T4 to T3 convert those natural remedies, supplement nutrients. It's often involving, uh, sorry, including selenium, uh, vitamin A, tyrosine, tyrosine A's. Uh, possibly rubidium as well to convert T4 to T3 and I haven't encountered individuals having palpitation from that. That would be my answer. Oh, she says, thank you. I lip read that one. Thanks, Christine. Glad you're there in the sun. That's nice. Uh, Maria, how about you? Are you up for a question? Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is, this is so fascinating. I mean, I've, I've also been suffering from heart palpitations. I think it was occurring more after I, you know, after my 40s. And uh, it's been quite frustrating because no one, no cardiologist seemed to be thinking out and all my tests, uh, H tests all, will also always come in normal. <laughs> so yeah. yes. uh, what tests, because I mean, it, there seemed to be resistance of doing tests that um, also shows the T3 levels. I mean, I never realized that with regards to if you have a thyroid condition or not. So um, what should I tell my doctor what to test? <laughs> well, if, if, if you can ask him nicely to test uh, your, well, actually a full thyroid profile, because I think it may be worth looking at thyroid antibodies as well, because um, that could be a factor. But TSH, free T4, free T3 and thyroid antibodies, it's sometimes reverse T3, which is actually what gets converted from T3 to reverse T3 by the deiodinase enzyme D3. So a slight, slight cul-de-sac of a conversation possibly, but... But I would say that a reverse T3 could, could lead to that. And when I found that people get palpitations, here's the thing I found, which I think you'll find useful to, to hear about, is that the imbalance between T3 and cortisol is more pronounced in individuals who have palpitations. So it's actually the gap between, if inverted commas, normal, um, normal levels of cortisol and T3. That tends to be... Um, a factor there. So obviously we don't want to support your T3 and get palpitations, but I would say that whilst magnesium and vitamin B1 are very important to the regulation of the heart rate and CoQ10 and taurine are very important for the heart rate, it's, it's, it's just a neurological signaling issue very much associated with hypothyroidism and so and then T3 levels. So you want to, so it's a question of, of looking to support blood sugar and cortisol. So I say and cortisol is not a good test to do with, with um, blood testing or 24-hour urine testing. You need a salivary testing for a rhythm of the day. So it's called an adrenal stress profile or a salivary cortisol test. That I'd be interested to see, Maria, because then you use a match. You want to check out the cortisol situation. Should have a daily rhythm of high in the morning and then mm. low. And if that's imbalanced, then maybe more likely of having a, a, an issue with T3, even if the T3 comes back as sort of normal in the test, even mm. the free T3. And remember, the levels of free T3 in the bloodstream may not be that which is actually in the cellular level. But I think often there's a, if, if it's all normal, really, really normal on, a, on an absolute tight band uh, with your thyroid hormones, then I would suspect you might have a cortisol issue. And furthermore, because of a cortisol issue, you may end up with a magnesium issue because cortisol prevents magnesium um, getting stored intracellularly after it's been depleted. So do bear that in mind. So I think cortisol testing and a complete thyroid testing will be useful for you, but beware, obviously, of T3. So use common sense there. You're muted, Stephen. Uh, Maria would also like to know about the connection between thyroid hormone and cardiovascular health. 
Yeah, there's uh, been identified in the 1930s. It was first identified that um, those with heart disease and furry arteries, as it were, um, oh gosh, you've got low thyroid, but they couldn't figure out the actual mechanisms until the 1990s, interestingly. And this is based on the work of some Scandinavian researchers. They looked at the lipoprotein lipase in particular. So the lipoprotein lipase enzymes are regulated by T3. So if you don't have enough of these enzymes, you don't metabolize your fats properly. And so you, know, you end up with more cholesterol in your bloodstream. Now, what's all interesting there? Cholesterol is neither here nor there. It's one of the 51 risk factors for cardiovascular disease, you could say. But low thyroid increases oxidative stress. And increased oxidative stress damages the endothelial tissue and increases the oxidation of LDL cholesterol, and that's pro-atherogenic. So I think in the, in the fewest number of words, I think I've succinctly described that connection. Uh, we have a question from Daryl. Um, he's got um, symptoms of subclinical hypothyroidism, yet his TSH, TSH is always low, and his doctor is saying that he's borderline hyperthyroid. Yeah. Oh, oh I, I have, you, I, you already I addressed here. that, but would you do it again? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it again. Uh, Daryl, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry you got that information. So stress and other factors such as inflammation and stress, those two in particular, they they have an impact on thyroid hormones such that. You, have a low, you can have a lower level through the interruption of the deiodinase enzymes, D1, in the body that lowers T4 and T3. So you have a low thyroid hormone. That should stimulate then a high level of TSH. But the D2, which is the intracellular deiodinase that converts T4 to T3, T3 gets raised and the hypothalamus perceives the raised T3. And so it goes, okay, I don't need to make so much thyroid and I'll lower my TSH. But actually, it's a, it's a, there's an issue, there's a problem. It's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a natural mechanism in the body that's not understood by most doctors and actually it reflects that there's too much stress or too much inflammation effectively directly having a negative impact and just because you've got those levels of tsh and t4 and, and the low tsh must mean you've got it must be a perfect negative feedback loop and therefore you must have hypothyroidism is absurd so if you can show the t4 and the t3 levels um, to show that they're low too that would require some extra thinking but this doctor may not be open to or understand uh, the information that I've gleaned from research papers, which are available to everyone, um, particularly to doctors, and it may not be that he has the capacity to actually help you, but I would question your cortisol levels and the inflammation. That's what I would do. Uh, we have a question here. It goes back to one of your earlier comments about uh, hypo hypothyroidism and gastritis and the um, acid pump. And, and uh, Priya says um, she started taking thyroid hormone and her symptoms are easing. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, um, it shows you, isn't it? And thank you for that, that question. That's great. And thank you, Stephen. It's the, um, it shows you the multiplicity of interactions. And gastritis is actually quite a common phenomenon. Um, so taking thyroid hormone has helped to decrease the symptoms of gastritis. Am I, am I repeating that right? No. Yes. No, so Anthony, um, I, it helps with other symptoms like hair loss and fatigue. Um, yeah. But gastritis has so I started the Armour Thyroid in November, so it's been, what, eight, nine months now? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the gastritis has been there, um, and I didn't know if the uh, Armour Thyroid, you know, if there was any connection between hypothyroidism uh, and gastritis. Oh, but I see. Forgive the gastritis me. has continued all year, yeah. and now I'm yeah. on a PPI, and yeah. Um, yeah. just it, this gastritis issue, has, you know, I've been tested for H. pylori, I went for endoscopy, colonoscopy, et cetera, yeah. so... Everything else has been ruled out, and this just kind of popped up out of nowhere, and it's really mm. been, you know, limiting my diet. Yeah, so I'm so curious. sorry. It's yeah, it's it's not not a fun state. It's all ugh, horrible. Um, there is a connection between H. pylori and, and subclinical hypothyroidism. There is, but you don't have H. pylori. There is a connection between Epstein Barr virus in the stomach causing gastritis and the connection with the thyroid, but that usually is more autoimmune conditions rather than subclinical hypothyroidism. And there's not a strong direct connection, as far as I'm aware, between having uh, low thyroid, taking armor thyroid and having gastritis, uh, and hence the fact I think that it's not resolved. So there's another issue occurring for you. Um, and in my estimation, um, now categorically you need to avoid salt. Okay, so you need to avoid salt. I hope you're doing that. Salt is a toxin for the stomach. Do not eat it, therefore. So you may be doing that anyway, uh, which is great. Um, no, I'm not. I you're not, you're not having salt. Oh, she just got muted. That's okay. Um, so I, I would certainly look at a number of remedies. So vitamin U, cabbage in, cabbage, Hello, cabbage juice. I, I think, yeah, yeah, it muted me. Sorry. 
Um, no, my salt intake is probably on the high side, I would say. Okay. Uh, um, my very bland diet. Forgive me. Yeah, so. forgive me. I don't know you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct you from England here. I'm going to direct uh -huh. you and say, don't do that. Um, as if I have okay. the power. <laughs> this is in, it, it's, it's intercontinental power, I've just demonstrated. No salt, please. Um, but I also, uh, yeah, because it really is a, a salt. But mastic gum is a, is a 2,000 year old ancient remedy from the, the um, island of Chios in Greece. It's a very good summit remedy. Um, cabbage juice, drinking cabbage water, cabbage juice water, um, you know, a certain amount through the day. It can be cooked or raw, juiced. It contains vitamin U. It's one of the most ancient, well known naturopathic remedies for gastritis. Um, and I wonder if there's some degree of biliary reflux, which is uh, present in 80% of individuals with a sort of reflux issue. But again, gastritis isn't necessarily reflux, but biliary issues are very, very common indeed with thyroid issues. So here we have a bit of a link potentially, is that subclinical mm -hmm. hypothyroidism can lead to poor bile flow and inappropriate mm -hmm. biliary issues, which can then lead to biliary reflux and bile can aggravate the stomach. And it may not be okay. stomach acid per se. So I wonder, but again, that should have been helped in a way by Armathara. But I would say, without knowing other causes, uh, avoid the salt and take direct remedies for your stomach. So mastic gum, and then a formula with, with either drink cabbage juice or find a remedy with vitamin U in it. That'd be my suggestion for you. And good luck. So um, it's interesting because just one comment, I've noticed that oils and fats make it worse. So oh. you're, you're talking about this connection now with uh, biliary and my doctor actually is sending me for a CT scan just to make sure other, you know, organs in that area are okay. So yeah, again, um, CT scan won't show dysfunction, but nonetheless, if it's non-invasive, CT scans are not harmful per se. So I would say it's mm -hmm. good to do that to rule other things out. Of course, I'd recommend that. So it's interesting. You, again, it's, it's interesting. It's just a conversation, chit chat, and you get ah, oh, fats make it worse. And and I would say that absolutely, the for fats could be it's a biliary issue, which I find to be to be one of these single, I actually gave a presentation on SIBO a couple of days ago and you wouldn't believe just mm. how many individuals have got SIBO due to a biliary issue. It's a lack of bile acids and proper bile acid flowing. And so for me, there's a liver issue and the long-term high subclinical hypothyroidism that you had before it was diagnosed and the vertical was treated with mm -hmm. thyroid may have led to a sluggish biliary issue. And that may have actually perpetually aggravated the uh, resulted in the bile reflux. So it's, it's, it's biliary, biliary support. So it's bile acids and biliary support to keep the motility moving. And bile acids have a multiplicity of wonderful benefits. There's, they have antimicrobial benefits. They stimulate the right contractility within the small intestine and large intestine, helping that bile flow. And actually the thyroid hormone directly regulates, again, activity of bile in the liver. So there may be that connection as it happens, although I, first of all, didn't identify it. Well, how about the issue of uh, chronic stress, um, impairing autonomic regulation and having the entire digestive system and all internal organs inhibited? I think you just said it, Stephen. Um, thank you. For that. How about that? Yes, I, I believe that's also true. The lower energy you've got, the less energy you've got, but also this, again, that whole, that whole system of, of digestion relying on thyroid hormone. To mm -hmm. me, it, it is, as it's Palmer has identified, it's, it's, it's a pandemic, it's affecting people and in ways beyond that, which is obvious, like, like loss of that eyebrow hair or being particularly overweight. So I think the whole, that whole nervous system connection, um, and I think, that, I think the barn acid connection is actually particularly relevant in this instance, as opposed to direct okay. thyroid hormone receptor activity. I would say that the thyroid hormone, its role in biliary and bile flow without adequate primary bile and secondary bile acids, you're not going to stimulate and, and latch onto TGR5 receptor, FXR receptor, this PXR receptor, that all that have these downstream consequences of, for, for the appropriate motility and the negative feedback with the enteric nervous system in the brain. If that Okay. Sense. Yeah. And I forgot to mention, I have mild fatty liver disease too, so that's not going to help. <laughs> okay. Yes. And that's one of my favorite subjects as well. Um, yes, I wish you well, but obviously losing weight can be vital for that. And obviously gaining weight with subclinical hypothyroidism can then lead to weight gain, which can then lead to direct to, to fatty liver as well. But again, fatty liver, really helping thyroid function uh, is going to be important for that as well. Great question. And I really wish you well with that. Right. wish I could spend a Thank day you. with you all um, to help identify what you most need. But it sounds like you've got some pretty good practitioners here. Maybe Susan can link you up with some, possibly. I want to have you back for future sessions. You're a gem. You bet. You know, I appreciate the words you say. Completely inappropriate, but thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> um, Macron, you want to ask a question? There we yes. go. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, I actually had a question, I think, that links with the, the last question that you were talking about. I was wanting to know about um, thyroid relationship with gut motility 
Mm -hmm. And um, I've been dealing with gut motility issues, bloating. Um, I had my gallbladder out after fighting for 10 years to keep it. And I, I don't think there was anything wrong with my gallbladder. I think it was more motility and valve issues. I also have ileocecal valve issues. Right. Okay. Um, I've been thinking the motility was more related to vagus nerve, but now I'm wondering about where where is thyroid in this picture? Yeah, I, I my, my sense is that vagus nerve is affected, but also with cholecystectomy, the gallbladder operation, there are 50,000 in the UK alone. It's probably 200,000 in the States every year. Um, and, and you can have, um, after post-surgery can absolutely be a factor in motility. So my question, Macomb, would be is, has the motility issue directly occurred after the surgery, which is a, a common factor? So the surgery may have affected anatomy and physiology on a muscular level, and that can decrease that, which means you need to pay more attention to motility and more attention to thyroid and more attention to bile acids than you did before. But the, you could have a blocking factor with regard to the surgery itself. But also the factors that led to the gallbladder issues reflect poor bile flow, and that would have also affected the motility. So to me, there's a there's an excuse the pun on the word mesh, but there's a there's sort of a meshment of of different overlapping factors here. But in optimizing your, you need bile replacement therapy for the rest of your life. So it's called BRT, bile replacement therapy. You need bile replacement therapy because you ain't got no gallbladder, and that gallbladder performed a vital function. Yes. Um, and you don't have it anymore. And that means you will not be producing the bile acids, which are having these effects on gut motility, which we've been talking about. So yes, we have talked about that, but you need bile replacement therapy. If no one has ever told you that before, let this Englishman tell you that now. And would that just be taking bile acids with meals? Yes, it pretty much would be. And you've got different bile acids. And so when I do my muscle testing with clients, I discover that they might need this one or this one or this one. And so, but, but yes, taking, I would say, a lipase enzyme as well, which, which breaks down the fat after it's been emulsified by bile. So a bile acid with, certainly with lunch and dinner, um, and um, not always with breakfast. Lunch and, and, and forgive me for saying it, but you ain't got that organ. You need that for the rest of your life. And so I, bile acid repair, it could be vital for you. You also may wish to consider the number one short chain fatty acid, butyric acid, which is also vital for bile flow, but also a vital for your gut lining and colonocytes. It's the number one short chain fatty acid, which is a result of, of munching fermentation of bacteria with carbohydrates. And that's vital for the healthy gut lining and helps with bile flow. And I find butyric acid along with bile acids, those two things sit there. And then as well as the thyroid support, the thyroid support to support the machinations and workings of the, of the bile itself. And to your question, um, I did have motility issues and bile reflux before the surgery, but everything got worse after. Okay. Yeah. So again, we've got this overlap. We sort of got layers rather than maybe a Venn diagram, more like layers, stacker. Um, for you. So all the more important for you to consider the butyric acid and the, and the bile support. And I really wish you well with engaging in that and finding a practitioner perhaps that can help you. Otherwise, it's, it's, I've got no reason why you shouldn't actually try those things yourself at home. That's the beauty of natural medicine. You can try it at home without risk, whereas I wouldn't recommend you try this and that medicine, for example. How about your, pers your uh, um, nutritional metabolic um, perspective on all the different kinds of thyroid medications out there and from mm -hmm. The, the armor to nature throid and then yeah. to either compounded or T4, T4, T3 combinations? Yeah, yeah. Um, very good question. Now, um, I've had a client recently, so this may be, this may be something that's I've had more than one client, I've had two clients recently that said, my nature throid just isn't working anymore. And I've heard this, I've heard it from other practitioners, and that may not be something that you, it has filtered to, to you um, in the audience right now, but nature throw, just, it just didn't work. And then they took a, they actually then took thyroxin and then they felt much better uh, effectively. So you've got the, the pharmaceutical grade, which provides an absolute categorical amount and it's, 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 it's shown away from food. First thing in the morning, it's going to be well absorved. And I don't think there's an issue with that. And I have said that thyroxin may be the best drug that there is because it's replacing the hormone you need. It doesn't mean to say that that's the only thing you need because you may need support for the conversion of T4, T3. As we've heard from one lady, uh, taking T3 um, uh, actually raised, it causes palpitations and it was too high. And I've, I've found that with many people who take the T3. So for me, I, I would say taking, if you need thyroxine, you need thyroxine, but there may be a thyroid glandular. Um, and, and I've used the Bartix Research one exclusively. And so I have no frame of reference for other remedies and I've, I've had clients with armor thyroid and all kinds of things and the vast majority need the conversion support of t4 to t3 
and therefore they need Medistim, which is the one formula I've used that I found to be effective. So when I found something effective, I haven't had a cause to go elsewhere to try and find something else, but I have found it to be the most effective converter of T4 to T3. I support in the de-iodinase enzymes and Medistim from biotics. And the typical dose with almost everyone has been two at breakfast and two at lunch. And I found that that helps to support the T3 levels without the need to support T3. And so I'm a fan of thyroxine where it's needed, but also I have found that the thyroglandular from biotics, which has got a strange name, it's called GTA Forte 2. And David Brownstein put that one together for biotics. Uh, GTA Forte 2 is the one that I would recommend. And I've recommended that for 20 years and found to be very effective. It supports T4 levels and T3 levels. But again, Medistim, I find, is a more, I find supporting the enzymatic conversion has been typically more effective uh, than if you like starting with T3. Clearly, if anyone here in the audience has taken T3 and it suits them perfectly, of course, don't change that. And why would you? If someone's not broken, don't try and fix it. But I, I would say that supporting T4 and then engaging with the, the conversion, but also engaging in all the lifestyle factors that support the proper activity of the D1 and D2 d iodinase enzymes, which is reducing inflammation and reducing stress. And then you're going to optimize all hormonal function in the body, including insulin, because subclinical hypothyroidism is also strongly associated with insulin resistance too. And there's an association with anemia and there's an, you know, etc. So we've got this sort of, we put thyroid in the middle and we find that we've got this interconnection with so many different aspects of health, uh, particularly with, with chronic ill health. So it's cardiovascular disease, also cognitive decline. But remember that what I said earlier, that low thyroid and indeed high thyroid states, but low thyroid increases oxidative stress and oxidative stress is the um, is, is that be all and bad all bad guy that generates non-communicable diseases that, that cost eighty percent of our modern healthcare? Um, Susan, do you have any stored up questions? Because I'd like to kind of take this a little bit sideways and go back to um, and think what you said about the nuclear transcription factors and the not only the thyroid but vitamin D. And given that so many people now are afraid of the sun or um, are locked in and can't get out to the sun easily. Um, what do you suggest as a, a potential solution or management of that yeah. problem? Yeah, it's a, it's a great broader question. In fact, the, again, what we're doing here is a natural process because uh, as opposed to siloing one condition, we can see that it's expansive and, and it expands to everything because everything's connected. Um, and um, mm. Certainly taking vitamin D to make sure your levels are optimal if that's what you need to do is appropriate. But vitamin D is one nutrient and there are 51 essential nutrients or 48 depending on which school you belong to. Um, and so we need a whole array of them. And vitamin D can in certain, certain places, certain receptors have the same receptors as vitamin A. And so you can actually diminish vitamin A, for example, by taking vitamin D. We need, we need both. And so vitamin A and vitamin D are very important. Um, they're pro-hormones effectively. So vitamin D, very, very important. I would say sunlight is the, the best bet. If you can't get it, then, then I would consider a mixed fat-soluble vitamin formula as opposed to just vitamin D. Vitamin D is easy to test. It's more difficult to get access to a vitamin A test. And vitamin K and vitamin E are the other fat-soluble vitamins. And so I, I often recommend a vitamin D formula with, with D and A and K and E. And so it's, it's that formula. So I would say for safety, in terms of your overall nourishment, don't just go for the one nutrient, although vitamin D has been held up as this amazing. And it's, it's, been, it's been identified in, in England as, as possibly the sort of specific targeted anti-COVID nutrient by one professor where there's a trial going on right now. Uh, Adrian Martineau, a uh, professor in London, has stated that. But I think uh, holism, holism is key. Multiplicity is key. And I think if you just concentrate on vitamin D, um, it may not be the, the best thing to do. So you need the fat soluble vitamins with it. Now we'll share with you some other fascinating insights into vitamin D metabolism. Did you know in studies on Americans, on you guys, although I can hear one South African accent, at least in the audience from Maria, um, is that um, if you don't have adequate magnesium, you can't metabolize vitamin D properly. And so it is in this study, and I wish I could quote the name and the, the year and the paper, but 50% of individuals who are taking vitamin D couldn't use vitamin D properly because they didn't have adequate magnesium. Now, magnesium is a vital nutrient. It's intracellular. And once you've lost it from inside your cells due to stress and inflammation, oh yes, echo, echo, stress and inflammation, right? And you take vitamin D and you don't use it properly. 
you can't metabolize it without magnesium. And so magnesium becomes vital. But what about the fact that stress and inflammation stops magnesium from getting inside your cells? So even if you take magnesium, but you've got inflammation and stress, you may still not be able to use the magnesium in order to use the vitamin D. And so, and so it goes. So every conversation we have, Stephen, there's probably some pathway to go. But the fact that 50% of individuals who took vitamin D were found to have inappropriate magnesium status, and that was not helping them with their vitamin D, I think is a relevant factor. So stress management, lifestyle, meditation, sleep hygiene, relaxing every hour, engaging in mindlessness, as Eckhart Tolle says, uh, to me is, is vital in order for us to make the use of key nutrients. Um, so once you've engaged in reducing inflammation and eating the whole food diet and making sure you're triggering the aryl hydrocarbon receptor with broccoli and cauliflower, raw or cooked if necessary, maybe more cooked if you're a thyroid culprit or candidate, um, vital to reduce inflammation, vital to manage stress, and then your body can use vitamin D appropriately and you can use and you cannot lose your magnesium. So magnesium is vital for vitamin D metabolism. I hope that's helped. Uh, how about testing in terms of um, just looking at your D3 level versus also looking at your 125 D3 level? Yeah, um, as far as I'm aware, Stephen, I think the 125 is, is uh, the, the active form is the one to test. Um, so you shouldn't have any D2, that's a synthetic form. Um, and I think that, that we can get lost. It's not a rabbit hole, but I think it's a little bit of a sidetrack to actually just get stuck on the testing. So I think 125 you want, a, you want a, an upper, upper normal level of vitamin D. And there are two different uh, markers, uh, measures of, of vitamin D. And I would say that that's, that's the best to aim for. But again, it's an isolated test and it's just one thing in, out of context. So I have to say that in my experience, virtually every client comes in with a vitamin D test. And, you know what? and, they, and each person needs vitamin D that isn't really dependent on a vitamin D test. I've discovered. So I'd say that testing is useful, no doubt about it. And more people need more sunlight, more vitamin D, no doubt. But it is one nutrient, one important nutrient of many. It's a pro hormone. So I think I think 125, um, the, the active form D3 dye, uh, is is the one I'd probably choose and select as, as a good thing for sure. Susan, do you have some uh, questions stored up? Well, I mainly want the audience to get what it wants. So. Um, you know, there's some questions. People had questions about how to relieve oxidative stress. And I think the answer is all these various lifestyles and a good diet, organic, et cetera. And, and, and absolute key antioxidants. About, oh, sorry. Speaking of you, apologies. People had questions, oh, sorry, <laughs> about T4 leading to osteoporosis. Um, also, uh, I know that you've written on how we can best protect ourselves against COVID virus. And I suspect the answer is keeping our immunity and health up but I mainly want the audience to have its needs met. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, three, I've got three minutes left, if that's okay. <laughs> you've got an hour and a half unless you've got another commit. I mean, you've got a half hour unless you've got another oh, commitment. Okay, I do have other commitment. Let me just see if I can change that commitment. How's that? Shall I do that? Well, while we're here live, I'll change that commitment. And uh, I apologize for that. Um, love to talk to you more. Let me, let me just see what's going on here. Let's go for here. You will be invited back. You're just too much of a jewel. You're, you know, I think flattery will, will, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to, forgive me, I apologize for it, this is like a live embarrassment for me, and I apologize. Um, you can make up for it by coming back. Yeah, no, well, I'm, no, no, I'm just going to. Um, this is one of the most information dense presentations we've ever done, so I think that a visit, a return visit would be definitely indicated. I'm gonna. This this my my. You're all gonna to have to thank my client, who shall remain anonymous, of course. Um, uh, I apologise. You're witnessing me. Um, if you can see my face, I, I've gone red in the cheeks um, <laughs> for embarrassment, um, and that hasn't happened since I was at school. I think so. I apologise. Um, that's me. Um, this is me typing beseechingly. Beseeching me. That's the, the adjective or the adverb. There we go. Okay, so back to that. Again, apologies. Love to answer more questions and thank you again for, for taking time out of your lives. I think time is one of the most precious things of all, one of the most precious things of all, um, as well as fresh air and having adequate vitamin D and magnesium. I'm back in there and, and my gracious client will be forgiving. She's, uh, I think she's in California as well, um, as it happens. Spooky. Um, so I'd love to answer any question on any topic, but certainly thyroid and oxidative. So I have discovered 
that is very, very hard to reduce oxidative stress with diet alone and, and lifestyle. Healthy diet, healthy lifestyle may maintain that level. But if you, en if you end up entering into a, a subclinical hypothyroid state, you increase oxidative stress, and that creates a vicious cycle because the oxidative stress impairs the D1, D2 conversion. So you end up having a, a hypothyroid state that actually generates the hypothyroid state, which actually then generates the overweightness, which generates the symptoms, which generates the, oh, I can't stand this. I need some sugar or alcohol now to feel better. And then you end up, end up years later thinking, well, blimey, that took me 10 years to get here and there's no rapid way out. And so specific antioxidants are to me imperative to reduce the oxidative stress. And again, it's one of the, one of the insights that I've learned perhaps the most significant insight in the great, in the in more in-depth study that I've conducted with the thyroid state has been just this, is the oxidative stress that occurs with low. Because I would have thought, and wouldn't you, in terms of understanding, that if you've got less energy being used, you've got less oxidative phosphorylation, you've got less oxygen use, and surely things should just wind down and actually not be so pro-oxidant. But in fact, it's the, it's the opposite. With low energy, you've got more oxidative stress as a result of low thyroid state. So antioxidants, broad spectrum antioxidants, glutathione support, vitamin E, uh, vitamin E could be that. So the vitamin D formula with vitamin E and vitamin K and, and vitamin A, that's an antioxidant formula. That could be helpful. I find CoQ10, I find tocotrienols, which is the big sister of vitamin E, very useful as well. Um, and certainly vitamin C on a regular basis, it could be useful as well as an antioxidant. So, so the more hypothyroid state you are, the more you need antioxidants. And I don't know how you do that with diet to achieve a therapeutic um, effect. I've got a question, there's Molly, Molly, Molly Peterson. Can you unmute yourself please, Molly? Do you mean, oh, go ahead, Molly. Uh, do, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, two questions, what kind of magnesium do you recommend? And the other question is, is there a relationship between heartburn and thyroid conditions? Yeah, we touched on that a bit briefly before. The magnesium, it does vary from person to person. The citrate can be very well absorbed. And the glycinate is an amino acid chelate, which transfers the, through an active transport mechanism rather than a passive one. But I find some clients do well with magnesium chloride. So Molly, there is no same one. This is the best magnesium you can have. There's also mag magnesium malate. But I would say for you, if I may be as bold to say this, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that you may be benefiting from magnesium chloride. It's a liquid form. It's passively absorbed, but it actually has a, it's actually the one that may be most useful when the other typical forms of magnesium are not so helpful. So magnesium chloride, it comes in much lower dose of elemental magnesium in liquid form. And sort of taking 15 drops three or four or five times a day, it gets well absorbed into the cells. Um, and I find that to be a very useful form for many individuals with subclinical hypothyroidism where, where and or where magnesium handling is not so um, readily or not so well done. In terms of the reflux, oh, we've touched on this already, but uh, certainly biliary reflux or acid reflux, in acid reflux, it's been discovered that at least 80% of individuals um, have biliary reflux, and not acid reflux. And only one individual of the 100 people tested had too much stomach acid. So the esophagus is uncannily sensitive to stomach acid, which is a bit of an irony because it's right next to the stomach. But if you have any bile entering the small, uh, from the small intestine uh, due to a biliary issue, which could be linked with high, low thyroid, then the bile can end up being in the stomach and the stomach can then, um, uh, you know, the bile can be acidic feeling and the bile, any one drop of bile in the esophagus can feel like it's acid. And so acid reflux could be biliary reflux in 80% of cases plus. And therefore you want to help the bile flow to flow downwards, gravitationally speaking, um, and, um, and not necessarily be on a PPI or, or an acid blocker because that, that doesn't solve the issue. So really it's bile flow support. You might need some soothing support with slippery arm or mastic gum to help the stomach and, and, the, and the, the esophagus, it's true. But, um, and also check out the food sources. So we know that wheat and gluten can often be a trigger, triggering for mm. reflux. So be aware of that, okay. fizzy water, spices and so on so check out the diet for triggers um and i would say that you're a candidate if i was a gambling man i would bet it was a biliary issue because it's 80 percent chance of being correct if you have uh, if you had an acid reflux but it's extremely common um and uh, your low thyroid or the low thyroid may be a factor in what's going on with the liver and then lead to biliary reflux yes okay christine you're up anthony um 
I have osteoporosis, but my doctors had really no recommendations. So I started on my own taking selenium and now my fingernails are harder, which I guess might be a good sign. But what do you think of selenium for osteoporosis? And if you like it, what dose? Okay, good question. Selenium is not in my top five nutrients for bone health. Uh, when I say my, I mean, it's not in the top five list of nutrients. I'm delighted that your, your nails are better for the selenium. It's interesting, selenium and helping nails, I think the many different nutrients can actually help nails. I've had clients with B vitamins, magnesium and calcium, or multimineral formula, and the nails have got stronger. And so I think it's a fact, a marker of a number of different things going on in the body. But selenium is not an integral component part of bone. Calcium, 99% is in your bone. Phosphorus, magnesium you need vitamin k for the proteins and vitamin d um, so vitamin k2 in particular so those are the most important five nutrients so calcium you're going to get by having adequate vitamin d in your diet um, and the, the it's interesting to know that the countries with the highest calcium intake have the highest rates of osteoporosis so calcium is not the be all end all uh, palmer knows this right um, and so it's actually the it's interesting that the, the countries with the highest calcium intake have the highest rates of osteoporosis and it's got nothing to do with the calcium intake really it's got to do with sunlight um, Eskimos versus the Maasai Mara. And so you need magnesium, very important for the use of it, but phosphorus is an overlooked substance. So phosphorus with calcium, integral for the matrix of minerals in the, in the bone with magnesium. But you need vitamin K2 and vitamin D. And I would say those are the five most important nutrients typically. Um, but um, selenium is an antioxidant um, in itself. It's antiviral in itself, but also it's a precursor for glutathione. And in supporting your glutathione, you may reduce inflammation and inflammation directly negatively affects bone health and there may be some benefit but it's indirect really it's not direct so i'll be looking at uh, vitamin d and vitamin k2 um, and i've had many clients i've had in fact there's no lady that i've met with osteoporosis that hasn't improved her bone mineral density on the t-scores yet in my clinical experience uh orna how about unmuting yourself and ask away so strength and exercise very important um and i would um and weight bearing and also twisty exercise. So more like dance. So, you know, you're moving it's sideways, not straight up and down. So twisty movements, because that helps the protein sinews in the bone, a uh, weight bearing exercise, um, vitamin D, vitamin K2 would be my priority things, but, but I'm glad you're saying so, selenium. So Anthony, I'm doing uh, K and D. So how would you, I'm gonna try magnesium chloride because I, I think it may help. And how, mm. how should I get the phosphorus? Well, um, I, I can recommend a product. I have no vested interest in this particular, I have no association financially with this at all, I, I have to say, but the, um, the superphosphozyme, superphosphozyme, and, and quirkily, I have one on my shelf. It was coincidence. Um, in there. Um, superphosphozyme uh, is a formula that Dr. Melvin Page put together and he calls it functional calcium. So basically it's calcium with phosphorus and they call it functional calcium. And I found that to be a very good thing along with the K2 and the vitamin D. So some insight there again, I have no commercial vested interest in, in oh, that. Thank you, that's perfect. No. That's exactly what I need, thanks. Great, are you related to Molly? <laughs> no. I, I'm not, no. No, no, great, no, just, uh, we've got two Petersons, that's all, that's great. Um, Thank you so much Hi. for your attention, Christine. Um, who's next? Orna. Hi. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Orna. Um, I, in the beginning, thank you so much for this uh, mm. great, great talk, by the way. And in the beginning of the session, you talked about the most the important nutrients, in your opinion, and one of them was the uh, protein. Um, for people who are on raw uh, vegan diet, would you, would you say that lots of uh, green leaf leaves um, would substitute for the protein requirement given that it has all the amino acids that are is required for the body to make protein? Uh, Do you, you get, where, uh, I, I, I must have been reading from different nutrition books, Orna. Um, amino acids, so protein are, are, the building blocks of protein are amino acids, yeah, no? Yeah, Orna, I need to share with you that I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours of studying amino acids and I'm a complete amino acid expert, even though that sounds very immodest and I apologize for that English language, immodesty. I am an absolute expert on amino acids and protein and I do not know what you're talking about when it comes to eating green leafy vegetables and getting enough protein. I have no idea how you do that. I, uh, unless my calculator was wrong, uh, but I studied, I've studied this for hundreds of hours, Orna. And I have no idea how you can do it. And in fact, I don't believe you can, or I'd love to be shown to be wrong because I'd love to be shown that green leafy vegetables can give you everything you need. 
So if you work out the numbers of, of grams of high biological value protein or indispensable amino acids you need, it is impossible to get it with green vegetables unless you are an elephant or a brontosaurus eating your body weight per day in green vegetables. Is that clear, Orna? Yes, so you're saying that there's no way to be raw and have enough uh, protein? Correct. From your not mm -hmm. eating green leafy vegetables at any rate. Yeah, I have no idea how you do it. The experts around the world for the groups of sarcopenia, which is related to age-related muscle loss, identified that the RDA, which is potentially what they call the ridiculous dietary arbitrary of amino acids and protein, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram, um, was woefully low, and they estimate that individuals over 40 to 50 years of age need one point, they actually need double that, 1.6, and so 0.8 times 2 is 1.6 grams per kilogram of protein, uh, providing the essential amino acids, of which there are nine, uh, and again, depending on which school you're in, but it's eight or nine, and there's no way on any mathematical equation that you could ever do that eating raw, even if you're eating all day long. Okay, thank you very much. You're really welcome. Thanks for the question. Listen, I, I appreciate it came across strong there, and I don't know, and please don't take offense, but it's just- No, of actually, course, I don't want to take the time. There's, there's, a, there's a big red button here, and, and although you can't see it, you just pushed it. So they, I apologize for that. But Orna, you know, without you there, I couldn't have expressed this vital message to this lovely audience of, of 62 folks. So thanks for, thanks for allowing me to express myself in a, in a fluent, natural way. Um, Thank you. I, again, I've studied that and I've actually done, I've got the spreadsheets. I've got spreadsheets. I've got graphs. I've read, I've read, I've read, I've read, I've read, I've read, I've studied, I've read, and I've had clients. And, we, and the, but what's fascinating, Orna, and it's a brilliant question, is can any of you name the test which tells us that we've got enough protein. Can you name it? I'm waiting. And you know what? We have to wait till the next show to get the answer because there isn't a great test. There is no test that tells you eating enough protein. You could do the amino acid urine test. You could do the amino acid blood test. But I've had people who've been omnivores, um, I mean, sorry, carnivores, and they eat loads and loads of protein and they've had low levels of amino acids in their bloodstream. You can't tell what someone's protein intake is from a test. Blood protein, albumin, globulin, that doesn't do it. Amino acids doesn't do it. You'd have to do it by assessing their protein intake from their diet. And what's fascinating, and it is fascinating, there is no test. I've asked the labs, I've asked Genova, I've asked Doctor's Data. Um, there's no test. You can implied in information, but the best test is dietary analysis. And um, the, the average individual, certainly over 50, will need at least 1.2, if not 1.6 grams per kilogram for, for protein. Absolutely vital. So for the green leaf eater, for the vegan among you, remain vegan, but use a protein powder. That's the answer. Okay. Okay, Diane. Yeah, Diane. Hi. Hi. I wanted to... Hello there. Um, Diane from Carpentry, actually. So wanted to get, see if you had any thoughts on the, what's going on in the feedback system, um, taking T3 and feeling more tired and hungry afterwards rather than getting an energy boost. The reason I would try taking it is because even taking a lot of T4, I can't get enough free T4 to feel good. And um, I take TSA essentially zero. Diane, would you uh, turn off yes. your camera, please, for any future questions? <laughs> okay, but it's nice to see you at the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, if that's what it is. Um, the, thank you for the question. So, um, taking T3 and you feel tired, so that sounds contrary. It sounds like it's the opposite of what should happen, and you can't take enough T4 to get enough T3. What's going on? So right. what's going on with the negative feedback loop? Is, is it that T3 is actually resulting in a somewhat quirky result of, well, I've got T3, so you end up with lower TSH. So I... You see, that's where blood tests could be useful to track. Is your TSH actually going down with a T3 and therefore you're not getting enough? T so it's sort of like a self-regulating, like, no, we can't let Diane have enough energy. Or is it that you have some other issue going on? And you, if you're trying to manipulate the T3 and you're getting, you're failing to, to maintain good energy, then there's some other issue. I would assert there's some other issue going on. So if you're not getting palpitations from the T3, you're not getting hyperstate and you end up being tired, there's another issue. And I'm going to identify what that other issue is for you. Hmm. Okay. Suzanne? I, I, I'm sorry, Stephen. Oh. I'm, 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 I was actually just literally considering what's going on for, for Diane. Okay. Um, I don't think it's a hormonal issue. I think it's a metabolic issue. And I would wonder what's going on with your liver in terms of the energy generation that it has within it. So I wonder if there's a liver issue and you are, you are lacking 
uh, in glycogen and your gluconeogenesis issue may be a factor. So if you look up gluconeogenesis, uh, Diane, and you actually define what that is, it's the production of carbohydrates um, effectively um, de novo from, from other resources in your body. I'm wondering whether you're low in that and the T3 then depletes your levels because um, your threshold was so close. It's like, oh, now no, no, the T3 is working, but I haven't got any energy in the cell because you've got a liver issue with the production of, 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 of glycogen. So you've got too low a level of glycogen, something going on there. Inflammation is going to be involved. Wonder about fatty liver issues, but I think there's a, I think there's a liver issue, Diane, and so therefore that takes a bit more of a complicated sort of engagement with you. So um, thanks for raising the question, but I think I think it's an energy issue, it's a metabolic issue in your liver um, for T3 to have that effect. That's my sense of things. Wouldn't that cause her blood sugar to go down slightly when she gets fatigued? Yes, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. You could test that with a home kit. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a, so, so you could track, you could track, and if it happens post prandsley you could actually do, as long as without, without making your fingers a pincushion, you could actually uh, get an ass assessment of blood glucose and see if that was a factor. Um, certainly, your levels should be uh, 4.5, but if they, go, if they go to 4 and below, I'd be a bit suspicious. Yeah. Do you think there's an osteoporosis risk when you drive your TSH down so low? Um, there's an association with raised T3 um, more than uh, with, with, with bone loss. So the raised T3 and hypothyroidism is a, one of the factors that leads to osteoporosis, less so at the low TSH. So less so, less TSH, but it's the raised T3, which can um, increase the bone turnover too much. And that could be a negative factor. So you too, so you need support with vitamin D and K2 and appropriate weight bearing exercise. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of frustrating. I'm between a rock and a hard place. I need more T4 to feel good. T3 doesn't work. And the doctor well, doesn't give me any more T3. The T3 may be working. And I question whether the T3 is not working. I would say the T3 is working. And then we go on that premise. So it's a question of making the right assumptions. And I would say the T3 is working because that's what the T3 does. It's working. Um, but actually, it's working. And the reason why you don't work when you take T3 is because you've got a, a separate metabolic issue. And I think okay. if you chase it through the thyroid pathway, you'll end up in a, in a what they call a roundabout in England. Um, you'll end up, as you know from commentary, you'll end up in a cul-de-sac going round the roundabout. Okay. Um, you, need to, you need to pan back and have a look at other factors. And I think there's a liver issue involved. Hmm. That's my sense. Anybody else? Suzanne. Hi there, Anthony. I'm really, really enjoying today's discussion. So thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for um, tuning in. It's a pleasure to be with you all. God, would that we're in the same room together without masks. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that would be great. One of these days. Um, I have a question about the thyroid and the eyes. And mm. I know you mentioned that dry eyes is a symptom yep. of SCH. And I think I've been dealing with this for a couple of years now. And just recently, I had a bad migraine in my right eye, which then turned into ptosis, like a droopy eye. And I have extreme dry eye. And so I'm wondering if that's related to thyroid. And although I did mention the dry eye in, in, in amongst the symptoms of subclinical hypothyroidism, and when I looked at the mechanisms for all these signs and symptoms, I discovered that dry eye was more associated with autoantibody production than it was to a low thyroid function. So then my question, Suzanne Mansell, is to ask you, whether, have you had antibody testing for thyroid? Do you have a, a, an unknown, I can't diagnose any of these, but do you have an unknown state of Hashimoto's where you've got raised uh, thyroglobulin or thyroperoxidase enzymes? Uh, do you, antibodies, sorry, antibodies, do you have an autoimmune condition that's leading to that? That makes me suspicious of that rather than subclinical hypothyroid. It's actually an autoimmune manifestation. Sorry to alert you and alarm you potentially, uh, but I would say that rule that one out would be a good idea, in, in my opinion. Rule out the autoantibody state, and there are things that one could do for that. The droopy eye, of course, if it's just one eye and not both, it doesn't, doesn't make us think of anything else like MG, for example. Um, but the, uh, so it's certainly worth exploring anything to do with eye health, such an important aspect of health. Um, I'm sorry you've had that. Um, I, would, I would want to rule out autoantibodies auto to thyroid. That's my first thought. And then you need adequate selenium um, as well. So there, there are my immediate thoughts, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very mm, much. You're really welcome. Yeah. Sheridan? Hi, Anthony. Great chat. Uh, Sheridan. Oh, there are three Petersons online. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We're everywhere. Yes. Um, so, sorry, I Peter. Have, I have a question um, about VDR SNPs 
and how they affect um, the vitamin D uh, synthesis and what you feel is the best form of vitamin D for people with the VDR SNPs. Um, are you doing the um, cod liver oil because it's got the vitamin A there and it's, and it's in a fat bound yeah, molecule? How do, you, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a good question. And there may, not, there may not be an answer for you, effectively. If you've got a VDR SNP, it just means you need to have a, a, a high level of vitamin D. But I, the, um, yes, the, the, the cod liver oil contains the cis form of vitamin A, folks. So it's, the, it's one of the very, very few um, forms of the cis form, as opposed to the trans form of vitamin A, which is the natural source of vitamin A. If you, ever you have a, a fish oil that's been processed and has vitamin A in it, it will not be the cis form of vitamin A. I'm slightly sidetracking. Um, so the cod liver oil, it contains the cis form, this shape, the C form of cis form of vitamin A, very important. But I wouldn't consider the vitamin A with this particular answer. I would look at, in order to, to support this with VDR SNP, and again, I actually don't know the exact percentages of folk who do have that, whereas I'm much more familiar with SNPs and other, other gene SNPs and the percentages. Um, to me, you're looking at, at optimizing vitamin D status, nonetheless, um, and I would use the emulsified, fully emulsified form that is absorbed into the lymph system um, before it reaches the liver. So it doesn't have to go through the liver processing. So my answer to you is, is maybe there are lots of different types of vitamin D. You need to make sure you've got enough. Again, focus on vitamin D, but then pan back and have a look at the whole. And I'd have a look at stress, inflammation, magnesium. Look at the other factors um, as well as thyroid hormone function as well. Um, and vitamin K2 to, to offset what the vitamin D lack might potentially manifest as. I find it interesting philosophically and evolutionarily to, to have vitamin D SNPs. Why is that there and what's going on? That's another conversation perhaps. Uh, the, the emulsified form of vitamin D, fully emulsified, fully emulsified, and biotics research, again, I, I've used their products, so I'm familiar with them. I have no association with them other than using them. Uh, we distribute their products in the UK, but I have no, no financial connection otherwise. Um, the vitamin, it's called BioDemulsion or BioDemulsion Forte, little drops, and it's been shown to be the most rapid um, support, the most rapid means of raising um, vitamin D levels, essentially. Um, so uh, the, I would use the emulsified form. I certainly think this is where checking vitamin D status is a good thing, and the good news is those tests are available, so you can actually measure your, your vitamin D. So it's not everyone with a VDR, certain VDR SNPs will have a low level of vitamin D, and so measuring your own levels. It's like uh, a similar subject on vitamin D, sarcoidosis, apparently don't give vitamin D because they mismetabolize it and you end up with too much. Well, guess what? In my clients with sarcoidosis, they did a vitamin D test and they were low, but they were told not to take vitamin D because they've got sarcoidosis. Well, I gave my clients vitamin D until they had a good level in testing. So testing is a good thing to do in this instance. Um, I hope that answers your question, but I think the Bartix research, if you have access to that, it's the, the, the BioD motion is one is 100% emulsified. Other companies with emulsified forms of vitamin D don't necessarily emulsify the whole thing. And that's quite a different, that's quite a different creature. So I like the emulsified form of the fat soluble nutrients because it bypasses the liver and gets to the body before it gets processed through the liver. Super. Thank you so much. Great question, Sheridan. Um, I probably couldn't Mary? give the best answer. Next Mary, one. you're up. Mary. Yes. Hello, Anthony. Hi, Mary. Well, I've been taking synthetic levothyroxine for the past five months, and my TSH levels are getting to getting to normal again, according to my doctor. Um, but the T4 to T3 conversion leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah. Can Classic. you comment on that? Classic Mary, you represent, I'm, I'm sure you're a complete individual that's completely unique to yourself, but you represent a classic stereotype of those individuals taking levothyroxine. And this is where the Metastim um, formula, the Metastim, it's the same label as this, uh, Bartix Research, the Metastim formula strikes as being, it's something I recommend virtually to everyone on levothyroxine who needs it because the T3 doesn't work so well. Um, the T3 is also the more powerful negative feedback loop agent to lower TSH. So if you take Metastim, I expect your T3 to improve and I expect your TH to come down. Then your doctor can say, my gosh, your TSH level has gone down. You must have, and it's below 0.5. And therefore I think you've got hypothyroidism. We must stop your levothyroxine. So you need to be aware of that potential conversation. Um, but I think Metastim is, is absolutely the way to go. Um, and, and then you look at T4 and T3. Uh, I'm glad that's being measured anyway. Metastim, two breakfast, two at lunch, it's a very simple change for you. I appreciate it. it's very simple and it's a little bit, you know, it's narrow because I'm not taking your whole case history, Mary. I appreciate that. But 
uh, in five months, I would have absolutely expected your TSH to come back absolutely normal. And the optimal level may be about 1 to 1 1.2 of TSH. Okay. Um, so and that's 2.5 uh, right now. Yeah, 2.5 is a bit high. Um, and, um, but uh, it's, about you, it's about you feeling well. You know, blood tests and blood tests and blood tests. I don't really, it's about you feeling really well. I mean, that's what I care about most of all. So if you feel great, then maybe don't engage in any change. But it's, uh, so, you know, but if you don't feel so great. I have to say, I have to say though, I feel really pretty good and pretty energetic. It's just that my weight won't budge and, and I can't understand it. T3 is the most active hormone in the body to burn fat, my dear. And right. so th okay. thermogenic diet, protein on a regular basis, burn more calories as you use the protein, high biological value protein, don't live on raw leafy vegetables only. And I would suggest medicine. Okay, thermogenic Medistin. diet, I'm sorry, I can find out more about that somewhere? Yeah, eat, well, I'll tell you where you can find out about it here. Eat protein in each meal. There you did. I've just told you. <laughs> yeah, eat Perfect. less carbs, less carbs, have no carbs at breakfast, protein in each meal. That is a thermogenic diet. And a five-hour gap in between meals, Mary. Five-hour gap. Okay. Okay. Minim minimize your insulin, optimize your fat burning, optimize your metabolic flexibility, burning fat, metastim, two at breakfast, two at lunch, no carbohydrate, protein in each meal. Let's see what happens, shall we? Or I, 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 if I have the pleasure of ever encountering you again, that would be a fine day. Thank you so much. Mm. Abby, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Uh, yes. Hi, Anthony. Thank you for giving us this wonderful talk. I have a question for you. I am trying to be gluten-free. Um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto probably about seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a little bit of goiter and I'm not sure what's causing it. I do eat seafood here and there, so not sure why. Okay. Um, here are the things involved. Are you, lack of iodine needs to goiter. If you're having seafood from time to time and you're having, um, are you having 150 micrograms of iodine per day? Maybe not, probably not. And so therefore lack of iodine does it. Now gluten, um, one of the protein peptides in gluten is actually almost identical to a protein in the thyroid. So avoiding gluten is a very good thing. And there's a strong association with gluten and Hashimoto's and celiacs and there is this sort of connection between them. When I say strong, um, that needs to be qualified, which I'm not gonna do right now. So if you've got goiter, you've got low, that means you've got low iodine. And the, the thyroid gets bigger to it will be more expansive to get more iodine from the blood. So you've got to have low iodine. Alternatively or and, in addition to the low iodine, perhaps, just perhaps, Patty, you have too high a level of another halogen. The halogen family in consists of iodine and of um, fluoride and bromide and chloride. So I'm suspicious when you describe this. So when I have seafood, I'm, you know, I do eat that. Maybe you don't have enough, but how many people do we know that's got a bit of a goiter? Well, maybe we don't start thrusting our hands on people's necks to find out. But I'd be suspicious that something's interfering with the ability of iodine uptake. Um, and so therefore I would, I'm just wondering whether, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering whether you've got too much of a, of a, of a halogen. Now the doctor's data do an iodine challenge test looking for, for halogen assessment. So they can tell you we've got too much fluoride and bromide. So doctor's data in Chicago, big fan of them. Again, I have no financial connections anywhere. Um, that would be something for, for you to consider. My next question, Patty, is, um, you don't happen to have moved into a new house. You don't happen to have a new car recently. No. No. Uh, okay. Yeah, two years ago, I have a new car. Yeah, two years you had a new car, huh? Hmm. Now, how did I know that? That's because Susan, Susan gave me your financial details and I, I could see there was a new payment two years <laughs> ago. Me. No, not Bro true. Me. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Bro Bromide. Bromide Bro from the plastic in the car. Ah, it's a classic. It's a classic. It could be. So, you know, I, I'm not saying it is, but that, you know, the whole story fits together and I'm trying to fit stories together. And I'm a pattern recognition guy, um, as I'm sure we all are, but it's just about knowing what patterns to recognize. So I'm, I'm thinking about bromide for you. Um, and if you've got bromide, it blocks iodine. So if you can have seafood every day, it wouldn't make a difference. So now you can't detoxify halogens the same way you can detoxify other things. I've got, I've got one and a half minutes left. Oh, I'd love to, you know, I'd have to be here for longer. So, but my lovely client has already been so gracious for delaying our appointment for an hour because that was my fault because I got the time wrong between California and UK. So that's basically what happened. Um, I'm so human. The, um, so Patty, I really, you know, I think having an ID, I think having ID on a regular basis is very important for you. Not too much, but I would certainly go for 150 to 250 MCG um, for sure. And I would say if that still doesn't work, you've still got the goiter, 
then I would definitely consider accessing, uh, maybe through doctor's data, they can tell it, find a functional doc near you and you can engage in that halogen test and have a halogen challenge test and just see how much iodine you're absorbing and whether you've got too much bromide and fluoride. Um, they do bromide, fluoride and, and, and iodine in that test. I've got one more question time. Thank you. You're welcome. Mary, do you want to ask yeah. the last question? Yes. Thanks. Um, Antony, I've heard you comment on gluten. Did you also comment on dairy? I may have missed it. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Thanks, Thanks for asking um, so much. So dairy, um, there's much less di direct connection between dairy and thyroid. Now there is a casein molecule. It, it has similar amino acid peptide sequences as gluten. And so there can be a cross reactivity if one has an issue with gluten and casein, but there is less evidence in studies as far as I can see. If I haven't seen many studies looking at looking at the connection between casein and thyroid per se. So I think it's going to be likely to a cross reactivity um, with casein and gluten. So it'd be a gluten first followed by casein um, and there might be some, some immune reactivity and that might potentially lead to an aggravation of our autoantibody response to the thyroid. But that's- but There's um, no, way of, no way of knowing that then. Um, yes, there is. You can do, um, you can be tested kinesiologically. You can do an experiment by avoiding dairy and seeing if you get better. Um, yeah. So there's definitely the clinical experience of where N equals one is, is a good thought, Mary. And soy? Soy, yeah. So, uh, okay, nice. This is uh, the, the last question. Soy, soy contains um, genistein, diazine, and, and, and various um, agent isoflavones, which are goitrogens. And um, whilst there is some doubt about whether soy does actually have a negative impact on thyroid, I think it can do. And it's a question of how much you have. And I think it's the volume rather than just having a tiny amount, whereas a tiny amount of gluten can be a problem. Um, I think with soy, I think the isoflavones, I would say just don't go soy heavy. And if you have a little bit of soy here and there, I don't think it's going to be an issue at all. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. You're a rock star. Rock star. Thank you, Anthony. I think been... I'll let you go for your next client. And I want to remind everybody Thank to you. save the chat. There's a huge amount of wonderful information in the chat. So save the chat for yourself. Yes, thank you, Anthony. Okay. Uh, yeah. anybody Thanks can, for having me. Anybody can make an appointment with him on Skype, etc. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, next, a, I'm a Zoom guy now. Uh, as oh, a Zoom guy. Okay. Zoom guy. Yeah. And next Monday we have Dr. Pizzarno, who's another gem. So. Yeah, I, I, I've been following Joe uh, for years. Obviously, he's a co-founder of Bastyr and IFM, etc. A legend. I can't believe I'm in the same same company with that name being mentioned at the same time. But that's that's great. Um, I'm going to leave you guys and I'm going to speak to my, my another Californian, a lovely person. So great to be with you. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah, so everybody who's still on the line, um, you know, there's all kinds of questions and answers and websites and links that are in the chat room. So please save it so that you have access to all that information.